Right, good morning everybody and welcome to the start of the Dorset LAF or DLAF meeting on the 22nd of July. Item one, welcome and apologies. Um, so apologies, so we do have apologies from um, Amanda Woolworth and also two councillors, um, Councillor Mike Green from Washington School and Councillor Jessica from the Dorset Council, but we do have Councillor Christopher who's um, Morning, Councillor Christopher. Well, is it in order? Don't be words. Of course it is. Please do. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Simon Christopher. I'm the Dorset Councillor for Marshall Vale Ward. I spent the majority of my life working in the Marshall Vale Ward. And I suspect that one of the reasons why I'm on this panel is that the leader of Dorset Council realised my rural background when I sent him details of the environmental land management system and the first soil module uh, it came live at noon on the 30th of June. So on that basis, he's probably picked up that I do have a deep rural background and I do care passionately about the countryside. I don't think I've ever really started an introduction about myself by talking about a Labour politician but famously, Tony Banks, when he became the Minister of Sport, said it was like going to heaven without the hassle, the dying. And clearly, with an interest in the countryside, I can perhaps relate to the comments of Tony Banks. Thank you very much. Um, we're very, very formal on this uh, committee, so if, if you would like to be called by the first member of the council, so yes, please, please, please. Thank you. You're very welcome here, and I'm sure your knowledge mm -hmm. and expertise will be very, very much greatly appreciated by the committee. Um, declaration of interests. As before, if you have any interest in any of the items that are coming forward, please let the committee know at the time so they can be properly recorded. Right, and we will now go straight into the public representation. Maria? Hi. Delighted for you to come along this morning and speak nice to, to us. Nice to meet you all. Hi. Am I good here? Yeah, that's yeah. lovely. Thank you. I think I must have got the presentation so that everybody can see that who is tuning in virtually as well as everyone in the room. Brilliant. So, hello, everybody. Thank you for having me here today. <clears throat> My name is Maria Di Figueredo. I'm part of a community campaign based in the Piddle Valley. Um, the Piddle Path Improvement Plan is working to restore a bridleway so that it is passable all year round by all bridleway users. So where are we? <clears throat> I don't know if um, you're familiar with the Piddle Valley, but we're about six miles north of Dorchester. And I don't know if you can see on that screen there, but we are made up of three settlements. So we have got Piddle Trentide in the north, White Lackington in the centre, and Piddle Hinton in the south. The villages are very lateral, of oh, competition in the background there. Um, the villages are very lateral, were spread along the B3143. And along that road, there are many different settlements and facilities to include two churches, shops, businesses, pubs. There's a community Millennium Green, tennis courts, playground, village halls and a football field. These are not only linked by the road that you can see on there, but the red line highlights the bridleway, which also follows the road. And this was a medieval drove road and was used regularly until around the 1940s when the B3143 was nettled. The bridleway itself is actually quite a hard surface as it is a medieval drove road. Much of it is hedged, there's drainage channels and some of it is tarmacked. Some of it has had hardcore put down by farmers to get agricultural vehicles through. Um, and some of it is 
turf. The original surface that can be seen in some areas where the water is washed off is probably like hogging, which is a, a crushed stone rolled with earth. So our proposal would be to restore the drainage, unblock existing ditches, install grips and berms, I'm told the call, and so base. Um, the, the runoff, which causes many problems because the, the hedges have been taken away in some of the fields, and the bridleway forms a low point and needs rerouting. The, the mud which has run down onto the bridleway needs scraping from the surface because although it's very dry at the moment, the minute the water table rises, the mud becomes wet again and forms deep ruts. And some of the surface the proposed surface was crushed stone, which is 20 mil to dust, as used in the Horton Bridleway project, which some of you guys will be familiar with. Um, and the approximate cost quoted was between 100 and 150,000 pounds. <clears throat> so the background of this project, um, this is not a new idea. It was reinvigorated during lockdown when many more people were using the bridleway and there was a lot of talk amongst um, governmental bodies about funding for this sort of project and getting people out in the open. Um, <clears throat> it was also mentioned in the school travel plan 2013 when it was written, the majority of families were are aware of the carbon dioxide in the 2012 Piddle Valley Parish Plan, that's 74.9% of respondents, and therefore it was incorporated on the back of that into the Piddle Valley Neighbourhood Plan 2018 to 2033. It was again presented to the Parish Council in April 2021 by the Action Team, the Community Action Team, and voted in favour of, and it's supposed, supported by the school, the church, the local pub, the local businesses, and was also promoted by the High Sheriff of Dorset 2021 and his Harmony project. So this is our alternative to the bridal way, the B3143. Uh, B3 I'm sure you're all familiar with these narrow um, Dorset roads. Um, we have got a small amount of pavement. We've got 30 metres in White Lappington. And we have got um, probably about 250 metres in Piddle Trent High. So that is a stretch of two and a half miles. <clears throat> we also have two industrial estates, one in Piddle Hinton <clears throat> and one in Pullham. And as a result, many of the vehicles are quite large. What are transport, the transport problems in rural areas? This affects obviously much, much of the area, not just the Piddle Valley. We have got rural hallway roads. There's no escape for vulnerable road users. You can't jump into the hedge if something large is careering towards you. There's no facility for parking. There's a small car park at the school, but this in itself has caused problems with the neighbourhood because it's not large enough. More and more people have cars and they're flooding out into the road and parking creates additional hazards for vulnerable road users, even though it serves to slow the traffic. The speed limit in the valley is 30 miles an hour, but it's met at both ends by the national speed limit. We've got large agricultural vehicles and trading estates. Agricultural vehicles are becoming larger and larger. We've no train or bus service. Dorset Council does not maintain the bridleways for bicycles and many of the old right of ways, although we are blessed with many in the valley, have fallen into disrepair. So much, many of the residents, when the bridleway is impassable and flooded, move out and drive out of the valley for cycling and for walking. People take their children down to Weymouth so they can cycle on the front or walk up to and um, take the children and the dogs for walking and jogging up in Charlton Down. There are major issues for minorities, parents with buggies, children, wheelchair users, the less and the visually impaired. 
and no priority is given to a right of way which is used as a transport link, opposed just for leisure. So why not use a bridleway as a sustainable transport link? So this is a beautiful stretch down at West Lane. Um, Um, for mille the Millennium Green uh, in 2000. This floods, but fortunately it is still passable when it floods because there is no one down there. So you can still issue for, for getting through. So a bridal way, it's a perfect multi-user route. It's already a right of way, a shared right of way for bicycles, equestrians and pedestrians. But quite often old drove roads with compressed surfaces and hedged with ditches. It increases the use of local facilities. We've got to get into a car to drive. People get in a car, drive out to Weymouth to do the shopping as opposed to walk to the local shop. It keeps local tourism in the valley and in the area. It increases links with nature. There is outdoor recreation on your doorstep for rural communities. It stops people driving out to walk elsewhere or to run elsewhere. It improves access to the countryside, promotes active travel. It preserves a green route for wildlife. We've recently embarked on a tree planting project along the path, which was sponsored by the local community. It reduces pollution encourage people to ditch the car, it links friends with nature, and it also provides a safe route for school. So why isn't this happening, I hear you cry. Some of the issues that we have encountered. There is a misconception by a number of bodies that a bridal way is primarily for equestrians, and as such, flooded areas are much more passable on a horse and could be considered fit purpose. There are concerns by some equestrians regarding increased usage by other user, user groups and sharing that usage. Landowners may object to increased passage over their land. Funding typically is based on demographics and travel patterns deliver much smaller returns in poor, in low population areas. Encouraging cycling can raise erroneous fears of tarmac and sanitising the countryside. Where well, there seems to be no comprehension of the needs of a route used for a transport link or of differing abilities of those users. So this is January 2021. As I said, um, there are Areas of the route which are okay when the when the water table rises. There are areas of the route which are metalled, and areas of the route that have already been resurfaced and some drainage applied. So down West Lane, for example, which but these are, are just some areas. I didn't want to bore you all with pictures of puddles. So this is January 2021 at the back of White Lackington. February 2021. So this is uh, the dog leg um, at the bottom of Belgrave land. March 2021. That is actually the same gate. May 2021. So this was a walk that we did with the school down to Millennium Green. So from Piddle Trent Hyde to Piddle Hinton. Um, and we went in the morning. photograph was taken of the bridal way that you saw earlier but here we've got children um, wearing wellies getting stuck in the mud and it was a lovely fun but it wasn't a commute to school and the final one so this is the last flooding that we've had this year because it's been very dry so this was March 2022 and that is between the CERN Road and um, Piddle Hinton Piddle Trent Hag, sorry um, and that typically this floods with runoff because the hedges have been removed from the, val the valley at the back of it, which is aptly known as Roger's Bottom. 
and um, the, the, when it rains, it runs down and floods the ground away. <clears throat> Solutions as we see them. So we've got the five E's there, empowerment, eradication, education, encouragement and emphasis. We need to empower communities to help raise funds and support them in these restorations. We need to eradicate fears by examples of successful multi-user user rural routes. We need to educate all user groups of each other's needs. We need to encourage all users to work in unison to safeguard against ongo the ongoing process of neglect, resulting in lost, forgotten, unmaintained, unrecorded and mismanaged right-of-ways. An emphasis must be placed on maintaining bridleways, which provide an essential transport link and an alternative to using a motorised vehicle. Currently, no acknowledgement of them being anything, there is no acknowledgement of them being anything other than a leisure facility. We need support from councils to negotiate with landowners. Improved access to and and a bridleway providing a rural transport link needs to be accessible by all users all year round to include buggy and wheelchair users, cyclists, children, the less able bodied and the visually impaired. The last slide. The lack of alternative transport links in our rural communities contributes to the steady decline of our environment as residents can no longer access facilities without motorised transport. The current situation is effectively forcing rural residents into cars or to relocate to larger towns and we are losing the very people who can help us create sustainable communities. Restoring a bridleway to link facilities and communities, as well as providing improved access to the countryside, will make a massive difference to the environmental, physical, mental and social health of rural communities. Prioritising existing right of ways to provide an alternative to the road creates a green artery which will help keep rural communities alive. Thank you very much for listening. If you've got any questions, please let me know. Right. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, I'm going to make it clear that we're not going to discuss this now, but I would invite questions through the chair for Maria for any points of clarification. Paul. Our um, readmittance of all of is recreational access to the country, so mm -hmm. we are encouraged to think in terms of things like through railway routes and so on. So what options can you point to in terms of linking this and especially following people from Dorchester up to use this landed facility? Um, so I have to say, um, Paul, that the the, the bridal way is more about creating facilities for people in the Piddle Valley. It would be a dream eventually for the Piddle Valley to be linked to Dorchester and for us to be able to cycle in off road because those bridal ways do exist, but we have to cross quite busy roads in order to access them. But it's about being able to link the villages of Piddle Hinton to Piddle mm -hmm. Trentide, and there are um, facilities there. The, the tennis courts, the sports facilities that people can't reach at the moment, that people are driving half a mile in the car to go and have a game of tennis or to, to go out and take the children cycling somewhere. So it's about providing those facilities for the people in the valley and also for them to be able to reach the other routes. We've got some beautiful bridleways and footpaths out there which are reached by this specific bridleway in the bottom. Well, I'll tell you, and I'm just simply saying that that, that is the forum, which we have made, but I 
hvis vi har først kæmpe, hvis jeg får op til, at vi kan sige, at vi har tænkt i det, så er det til at have en rød. Det er det, jeg Ja. Well, it can be linked in, but it's taken me 18 months to get here. <laughs> so, um, as it's taken me this long to get this far, we're concentrating on the Piddle, on the Piddle Valley Path. The, the, the middle school for the children is in Puddle Time, and there's a bridal way that links between um, Piddle Trend Tide and Puddle Time, which could be linked up. But unfortunately, the community campaign um, We'd love it to be linked up. Anybody else have any questions? Any further questions? <clears throat> I have oh, the gentleman there, sir. Oh, I beg your pardon, sir. I was merely going to observe and not to comment, but as somebody who uh, regularly uses the throwaway, Thomas to Newton, and Blue Shillings, the star pain, etc., I do get it. I get what you're saying. I also do get the fact there is inequality across Dorset about provision for safe cycling. Thank you, Sam. And horse riding. And horse riding. The full, full gambit there. Uh, I would point out that a generation ago, no humpback bridge, I think, was actually dismantled. The Hamoon Lane that was allowed for safer cycling and walking. Equestrian between Stums and Newton, Chilling. So. Um, I've got several questions arising from what you said. You talk about unblocking grips and ditches. Unblocking ditches and providing grips. And providing grips. Yeah. But if there is an issue there, have there been any reports of? Defects on this way to the public green space team, the way department. Are there any NMTs being reported? Many. Many. And what's been the outcome? Under investigation. Or suitable for um, access. Fit for purpose, I think, is. Sure. I'll let you come in there. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Um, so, yes, when we've, uh, I've gone out and visited the, the route with. Uh, as is Tara uh, and Councillor Jill Haynes, Councillor Noblex. And uh, we have identified areas which do need improving, and we've got uh, even got quotes for that. Um, it, it is, uh, as Maria was saying, it is acceptable as a right away. Um, it does function as, as such. However, as Maria has explained very well, the objective is really for it to be to a higher standard than that because of the advantages that the mother has outlined. So it is on our radar. Um, we have some areas are better than others. There are some particular points which are worse than others that are shown by Maria's data. So we have um, really now it's about an issue of how that compares to other schemes. This isn't the only area, obviously, as you'd imagine, with 3,000 miles of right away, there's this other uh, worthy causes across Dorset. Um, so it's about how that compares, uh, whether we can support that, that bigger objective uh, above and beyond the sort of this basic standard of right away, and then where we get the funding if, if that was the uh, okay. But there's a few, there's a lot we agree with Maria with, but there's a few hurdles to overcome. And Another point, you said that the school pub and local businesses and the parish council and support, are they supporting this financially? We have had offers of funding, yes. From the community? From the community. From the community and also local businesses. Mm -hmm. Right. And I take on board that it's, I've actually walked the route down and back um, in February after the rainfall and you know, at that time, it was perfectly walkable. I'm, I hear what you say, and we will discuss this at a later date, but just to get it into my own mind what the situation is there, 
it's a medieval grover's root. Has there been some significant deterioration in it in recent years? I think, Philip, that just generally over the years with uh, removal of hedges, it's created an amount of runoff and the ditch is becoming blocked and also less frequent traffic. Because as soon as the the B3143 was metalled, mm -hmm. it, it would have been an easier route for everybody. So everybody would have moved. And of course, you know, the, the inclination to jump in a car in a rural community. Um, so people have taken to the cars and there's been less people using it. People are driving cattle and carts up there once upon a time, as they would have done once upon a time, and that would have cleared. So I think um, generally over the years, um, it has deteriorated and it's just not been maintained. Right, okay. So can I, uh, you, you raised the question about hedges. So is there a move to try and basically put the hedges back? If, um, if, if the problem is basically that there's nothing holding the soil anymore, then it seems that one of the answers is to replace the hedges. It is indeed, it is Nicola. So um, there, there are, stretches of the bridleway which were already hedged in fact probably guess the majority of the bridleway is hedged um there are two um fields where the bridleway goes around the edge of the field which are not hedged and um, one of the landowners is very supportive and we are speaking to them about hedging it the other landowner is a little difficult to get get hold of Right, well, if you're satisfied. Right, well, thank you very much for the excellent presentation you put before us. And um, we will discuss this at a later meeting. Brilliant. Thank okay. You. Well, thank you. Thank you. For thank time. you very much indeed, Maria. Thank you. Brilliant. <coughs> sure. Right. Jim. Um, we, we now move on to item three, the minutes of the last meeting, actions and matters arising. Uh, does anybody have any comments on minutes from the last meeting? If not, I'm happy to propose from the chair that they are a true record. Do I have a second then? Thank you very much. All those in favour? Any against? And any abstentions? Right. Those are duly carried. We go on to matters arising. Right. Okay. Item A four two adopt standing order changes. That's been done. A5.1 email comments, suggestions on web pages. That's open. A5.2 July group photograph. We we'll do that at the end of the meeting. Um, A8.8 multi use routes working group. That we had a meeting and that's contained within the minutes of that is done. It's in the agenda papers. A9.3 circulate access land restriction reviews. And I've circulated some of those. We had one as well that Evan was aware of from the Forest Commission, which we all bemused about, but when they confirmed that it was a mistake on their part, we had one other one which is in the agenda. And so that's ongoing, lastly, but they haven't been done. So down to 9.6. Oh, okay. 
investigate long questions than are these to report access land issues. Yeah, and that's still, um, that, if you remember, my previous manager was working with me on that, he's now left, so that's ongoing while I'm working with the market. 9.7 circulate potential proactive. Mention in both complete report to ratify. Going a 10.2 inform that we England send ECP in the diversion proposals level of ranges. D lap open a 11.2. Um, that was Vanessa. Vanessa that's yeah. right. Did I implementations patch boundary changes on simply the map? So I did that on behalf of Chris and Vanessa has come back and said that and um, Vanessa's here today with me. Um, next, I mean, basically you can add to this, but you basically explain that the legal record team have not been made aware of any parish boundary changes, but that they would remember past as required and informing interested parties. Vanessa, there's nothing else to update on that, is there? No, no, we still haven't heard anything. Okay. Okay. 11.3, ask Vanessa of replacing retiring staff member. Done. Yeah, so there's a new member of staff in post. I don't know again, do you need to add anything to that list? No. A11 for Paul's letter, re-resources, process, yeah, I know that one's open. A11.7, ask Vanessa how Lando and the files rising will in work mode. So again, I've done this and circulated. So uh, Vanessa's responded, this refers to the right to apply, which enables landowners to apply to us to have paths diverted or extinguished. Many authorities do not do any PPOs as they are power and duty. The main issue for Dorset Council legal team is that the legislation states that we will have to determine each application within four months of the seat. Even though we no longer have a backlog, this is almost impossible to achieve, especially if we receive objections to the consultation and have to go to committee. Strategic and Technical Planning Committee only meets every two months. We would therefore need to prioritise these applications and that would cause delays elsewhere. At the moment, we have no way of knowing how often the mechanism will be used as not yet been implemented. So I don't know if anyone wanted to ask Vanessa any more about that. Okay, 11.8, inquiry of DLAP can be notified of upcoming public inquiries. That's done. That's done. 12.3, Organise possible commission woodland creation officers to be guest in July, and that's provisionally booked for November's meeting. Yeah. Uh, Twelve five business recommendation mm -hmm. two letter to Defra relating to Elms. We've had no reply on that. Twelve six implement recommendations five and six right like Defra National England and Secretary of State. Natural England contact from Nicola. No reply on that. A fourteen four draft DLAP response to government's response to landscape review. That's been done. A fourteen five ratify long and um, what's part thirty three DLAP response in July. I can add to that one because also in my capacity within um, responding to planning, I responded to that application endorsing that the footpath um, should be reinstated alongside the development. We did, um, of course, the local access one view on that. The developers actually were very positive on that one. Um, they were going to reinforce as part of that development process. So, the view. Okay. A15 one access plan working group revisited. That's been done, that was Jim and, um, and his team, and he's got the report today. A15 to circulate trial MMT update. Giles, and I sent me that. Yes, thank you, Giles. Um, A157, invite Giles, he's here today. You're very welcome, Giles. A59, prepare paper, suggest a planning working group. And Janet was going to originally do a verbal one, but you've also managed to do a written one. So thank you. That, that was, I think, uh, yeah. A fifteen eleven circulate partners strategic groups info it's ongoing. A sixteen two right to Dorset Airview 
regarding new access bar, triple access grants. We're awaiting feedback on that. We are, but we have now got a report come through, so I can circulate that to you. And finally, 16.3, send latest correspondence to report the path and pull together an update Stay briefing ready. report. And we're awaiting response on that. Okay, right. So we now move on to item four, the legal record team, definitive map and statement. Vanessa Penny, over to you. Okay, good morning everyone, thank you very much. Um, I know you've all seen a copy of the report and have it in front of you, so I won't go through it in great detail. I will just summarise and then just open it up for questions really. Um, basically, in, in summary, we're still in fairly dire trouble with our definitive map modification order applications. Uh, the backlog is increasing, as you can see, and we're starting to feel like we're never going to move forward with this. We do very much, though, appreciate the amount of effort that the British Horse Society and the Ramblers and other individuals as well are putting into submitting applications. Um, which were obviously initially fueled by the 2026 cutoff date, which hopefully the repeal will go through. But we completely understand that obviously people have projects ongoing, and while they're doing that, to submit the applications is obviously very worthwhile. And we very much appreciate the effort everyone's going to. It's just starting to look a little bit scary. But in other areas, as you've probably noted over the last couple of years, given the circumstances of the pandemic and changes in working practices and things like that, we have done extremely well. And we've made huge progress. We've completely destroyed the public path order backlog, the order making backlog is gone, and we're up to date in all other areas. It is just the dipping to map modification orders which feels like a bit of a massive mountain at the moment that's off to the team for achieving what they have done so far and we're now focusing as much energy as we can into the modification orders we're trying to refine processes where we can we are hampered by the legal processes but we're just doing what we can but we basically need more resources but there isn't any facility to support that because of the situation that the authority's in. So that's that's it really. So if anyone has any questions or would like me to elaborate on anything, then let me know. Thank you. Any questions from anyone? Oh, can, can we say Vanessa on the screen you think for a minute? Yes, she's there. Um, um, after our meeting several months ago, I did write to your you manager did. and also one of the councillors in this area, with responsibility in this area, expressing our concern as to um, resources. And you, uh, I remember you acknowledged that you had the lesson. So I'm um, I think the letter was worded so as to say, well, please, what as councillors are you doing about it? And we did ask, you know, what are, what are the resources that are needed to comply with your staff duties in this area? And I'm not conscious that we've ever really had a response to that. Council may simply feel that it can't afford that. It's almost a separate issue. We do need to actually let them up to be an option on the table to say, yes, this is the level of staffing that's needed to provide an acceptable service to the public. 
Okay, is there anybody doing it? I'm sorry, I didn't just couldn't quite catch the last thing you said. So if the if does do you believe that your management have any plans to respond to that question? I I would have hoped you would have received a response by now. Um I I did speak to the managers about this and I understood a response had been sent, but I would not have been party to that. I would say that the management team are very well aware of the situation. Unfortunately, we're not the only area within the planning service that needs extra resources. And obviously they have limited funding. And so we're we're not top of the list, I'm afraid. But they are aware of the issues and they are very sympathetic. We're not being dismissed in any way, shape or form. It, it simply is a lack of resources across the whole service. But I'm 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 slightly concerned that you haven't had a formal response to that because I know that was some time ago. If, if, if you could check that, that would be helpful. Certainly nothing's going to delay you and you I don't think I'd be I, I can chase that up. Anyone with any further questions? Yeah. Can I just ask what proportion would be evidence based from the physical evidence or an application for the MMO? You know, I'm saying maps plus tide map plus vestry minutes plus um, parish council minutes and so forth, house authority notes and what would be evidence based what proportion would be evidence based from users submitting statements i've not actually calculated it but i would think that at least three quarters of the applications we have now are based on documentary evidence alone rather than either a combination or purely user evidence. Right. OK, the, the reason I ask about user evidence is that invariably when you're going back 20 years from the, the MMO going in, which effectively triggers the bringing it, calling it to question in some ways, you are dealing with somewhat aged people and aged people have a nasty habit of dying before the inquiries go forward. Do you try and progress the claims? Do you have some sort of triaging where you think, right, OK, here we have documentary evidence plus user evidence. We need to get this higher up the pile and prioritise it. We do have a statement of priorities and the availability or potential availability of witnesses is one of the possible reasons for prioritisation. The statement of priorities, however, does rely on the applicant contacting us and requesting that their application be prioritised. And we do appreciate that this isn't always possible and not everyone is aware of it or has forgotten. We do advise people when the applications are initially made, but Obviously, when time has passed, people do sometimes forget this and move on. So we are looking at revising our statement of priorities and also at our prioritisation system. Clearly, if someone submitted an A, which was based on user evidence, we couldn't legitimately expect them to wait until we dealt with 171 other applications before we turned around and asked them to sort of more information. So we do understand that the situation is not sustainable as it is. So we are in the process of working up a new prioritisation schedule. As everyone is aware and that cases predominantly on user evidence or significantly on user evidence can be prioritised in order to actually get the maximum benefit from those people's knowledge. 
Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. You know, a lot of cases aren't cut and dried where you've got some parliamentary actors, either railway plans or closure awards. So, yeah, we, we don't want to lose the evidence where we have got user evidence. That's what I'm trying to get to. OK, thank you. Paul, come in. I can remember uh, several years ago now, Vanessa, you or one of your colleagues did actually come along to one of these meetings and talk us through your prioritisation process as it then was. And I think we were quite happy with it. Um, if you're revising that process, at what point in the start would it be helpful for you to come along and talk us through your new one? Well, as soon as we've finished drafting one, I'd be very happy to present it at one of your meetings. Obviously, the last time we did that, the LAF support was incredibly helpful, and we did then take the proposals with your support to our committee, and it it received unanimous approval by the committee. So that is our intention to bring it to the LAF again for consideration before we finally implement it, because your support is very valuable to us. Thank you, Paul. Right, no further questions. Um, I thank you very much for your attendance. So it's greatly appreciated. And, um, thank you. We see you back at the next meeting. Hopefully, yes. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you for being there. Thank you. I'll move straight on to, to item number five, which is public rights away Dorset Council Management and Maintenance. And Charles, thank you very much for attending this morning. And we'd like to hear from you. So if you'd like to talk us through what the situation is. Um, Okay, I'll throw, the, I'll throw it over to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Giles Nicholson. I'm service manager for Coast and Green Space Service. And that includes nearly everything green that the council does, from merge to rights of way, of course, to um, country parks, nature reserves, triple SIs, town parks, right through to managing school grounds including the natural environment team that uh, Tara sits in, um, lots of technical experts, ecologists, the ARB team who look after the Council trees, especially on the highway. So it's a real uh, diverse service, but obviously its focus is all about green space and the assets that Dorset Council manage, including the rights of way, of course. So, as you all know, there's 3,000 miles of rights of way, and we have five teams of five senior rangers, five ranger teams that are geographically spread across Dorset. Um, most of you, I'm sure you will know, goes to your area. And they manage the, those countryside parks, nature reserves, land that we own, rights of way and the highway verge in their area. And they have inbuilt teams that deliver that, that work. So the public <coughs> reports problems on the rights of way network. They they uh, use a reporting system on Dorset Council web pages. This comes through to us in a system called Seaside, letter C, of Countryside, and that provides that information of where the issues are on the network, and uh, and then they are prioritised and the teams then victory. Um, on the screen. I've got some stats of how much work we, how many of those jobs we deliver. Uh, I think I can't quite see it from here, but it's going back, I think, to 2013, 14. And um, it gives a summary right up to the 31st of December, 2021. So it's, uh, we haven't got the last six months of data. But it shows that while we, we it doesn't tell us if the network is improving or not, uh, but what it does tell us is that we are more in line with delivering and solving the issues, the number of issues that come to the service. Um, we are delivering more than we've ever done before. And that is a combination of people being locally, local working in their geographical area, which reduces travel time to the jobs, 
it's much more use of apprentices and volunteers so that we can maximize the boots on the ground which delivering that work and it's also by combining with those other services uh like highway verge or all the sites it means that we overall have a bigger team working under each senior ranger and therefore we can move that team the different priorities of work as they come through a really good example of that is um, we have a lot of people within the team to help with verge cutting, but then as soon as that starts to ease, that workload starts to ease come well, this time of year, really July, August, through all the way through to next April, um, it means we have a lot more staff available to uh, work on the rights of way network. And that's really why the amount of jobs that we are uh, delivering has, has increased. Still is increasing, but probably we will expect it to level off at some point up and up and up um so i think the teams are working really hard doing a great job um whether the network overall is improving or not those that data does not tell us i don't think we've had a condition survey or i don't know tara do you know where the last one was yeah basically when they shut them all down so it's about 10 years ago it's bbpi 178 which some of you will remember and around this took part in and, and then a lot of it some authorities still continue, but we change the Yeah. And we have all that. Do we have that? We still have that data. We have the historic data, but yeah. So we could really do with a condition survey. Uh, I'd really like that. Um, there are problems with COVID didn't help. I know I did speak to the Ramblers about whether we could look at that again. Obviously, COVID wasn't a good time for that. And also, even to look at that BBPI methodology, which, you know, while it'd be good to have like for like data, some of that BBPI um, I didn't think was uh, terribly helpful. Um, but yeah, that, that's uh, that's something I'd, I'd like group to have a think on and they feel that they'd like to see that. So I mean that's a that's a, a very quick summary of the thing. I, I didn't have any agenda. Other than that, or, or full sight of questions, so, um, hopefully that gives a little overview. And obviously, I'm happy to answer questions. Chris, what are the same um, problems time after time over the year? And nothing's done about them. Um, mainly, it's um, parts which are um, signed um, um, offline as if they've been um, unofficially diverted. This is the greatest company maps, or they just take them line of least resistance, or what? Is this where a right of way is not available, but there's an alternative? Um, well, it, it, it could be available if, if they if they open it up. Um, yeah, the right of way. Yeah, yeah. What I'm asking is, is there an alternative route which is not a right of way, which yeah, is a, which is fine to put it right away. Sorry, I can't hear. Which is um. The alternatives are, are, are signed as if they are the rights of way, um, but, but they're not on the definitive map. Well, no, well then they shouldn't be signed as rights of way. But there are examples of that. I mean, yeah. presumably that's landowners moving the signs, because well, I've come across that. Well, no, it's, um, we've got the um, in footpath one and all in Maiden Newton is um, the, uh, on, 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 on the Froome Valley Trail. It's got all the, uh, and the Midland Way, they've got, they've got their labels on the signposts and things, but um, not on the, on the right line. Okay, well, obviously we shouldn't be putting right to way signs on routes which aren't right to way, of course mm -hmm. not. But I, I'm sorry, but I've been reporting this for year after year after year at the, at the first radiation officer. To, uh, so the, in Maiden Newton, so that's, yeah. so you've reported it to the department team? Yes. And it's on the Freeman Valley Trail. Yes, um, that one is. There's also um, a, a path up um, near Notting Hill Barn, um, where um, I think it's about 1993 I first saw signed um, on, on the wrong line. Um, uh, and um, it's, um, it's signed going through a field gate across a field, whereas in fact um, the, the proper route goes up to an avenue of trees. That, um, uh, and then um, through a gate, which you can still go, up, go up to the trees, 
Um, but then you come to a gate, which is um, uh, unopenable, unclimbable. Um, and then it turned right through a hedge, which is not way through. Would you mind, Chris, if you just give me a list of all the yeah. issues that you've noticed that okay. haven't been actioned, if you could email that to me directly. Yes, and I will read that email address. I can, I can get that to you. Yeah, yeah OK, thank you. Because yeah. obviously I want to solve it as much as you do. Yeah. And if it hasn't been actioned through the normal process, then if you you could just give me a bullet pointed list of the yeah. issues. Mm -hmm. I will. OK, thank you. Um, when I first saw this, that figure of 55,549 in the system, I sort of almost fell off my chair because I thought that meant that that was the number of problems that you've got to solve. And obviously it isn't. Is there, can you give us a, a rough figure for how many at any one time are active and waiting solution? Like outstanding? Yeah, um, outstanding, yeah. Outstanding, um, without looking at the data, but I would think it's um, less than 2,000. Right. And are some of those quite old? things that are two years old, five years old, ten years old, are there some that are really insoluble there? It's a mixture. Um, with seasides, some of the issues are incredibly simple. Um, you know, finger post off a metal road has fallen down, yeah. um, rotted out, etc. Um, which are legal, technical problems, even uh, Vanessa's involved in getting them sorted. So, think the, the, the straight answer is they're very diverse. Mm -hmm. Some take years, you get 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And is, is there probably the heart of everything is the, the prioritisation that is given to, to each problem, really. Um, and the way that that reads when you do put something on onto um, the system, you, you put a problem on the system, you get your MNT number. And you go back, and it's very difficult for just an ordinary member of the public to understand exactly how it is. Prioritize things, yeah. and then you get you get get the report back um, under investigation, and you've got no idea what that means. Um, and I think the the public, and I've spoken to to people who don't period rights away other than they use them and occasionally report a problem. They find it very difficult to understand what what the how the prioritization scheme works and yeah. what under investigation means uh, and how quickly things get it allocated out to teams and so on. Yeah. I think there maybe could be some work done on 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 that, on the feedback that individuals get when they report problems. Yeah, we have improved we have looked at improving our feedback. Just of the issues you raise, but yes, it, it, uh, everything's been improved. I, I would like to see that improved. So yeah, leave that one with me, and I will talk to the team. I've actually got a team meeting next week with them, with the senior managers, look at how we can improve that. Because uh, I, I agree, it's not completely self evident. I mean, one thing I would say about that there is lots of talk about a priority system that we had, which was public facing. But it was only about, I, I thought it was quite misleading because it, it gave the priority in a time frame. But it was about, about its inspection, not yes. about the solving of yeah, the issue. And that, yeah, people did find that very, that was I thought it was difficult. Yeah. yeah, and I think it actually caused more misinformation yes. than it helped. Yeah, I would agree there, yeah. Um, but when things go on to awaiting works, then it, then that is really when um, they tend to be the simpler jobs mm -hmm. because it's things like you know, finger post fallen over. Awaiting works is the teams going out and doing right. it, and that is where that that sort of that graph shows that we are sort of knocking out four thousand yeah. of those rather than you know mm -hmm. fifteen hundred a few years ago. Because of um, uh, unpaid unclassified roads as well. Unclassified roads. Uh, unpaid, unloved, un un uncared for. One. Yeah, they're with highways. Mm -hmm. They are with the highways. Not with, not with. And who yeah. report problems on them? That's uh, still a report problem. 
on the Dorset Council website, but that goes to the highway system um, and it goes to the uh, community highways officers. Uh, so they're still within the remit of highways. There's an, um, an update we can put across an unclassified road that's um, rather federal. I, I first reported it um, when the concrete was still wet on the first post. Um, <laughs> no, it's been um, locked for probably about seven or eight years now. Mm. Feel free to send that to me, although <clears throat> I, I, will, I will reply to you and copy me in the relevant person from okay. my base. Right. No, it's uh, this may not this may not be you, Giles. It may be highways again. Um, but it's how paths which are subject to traffic regulation orders are shown on Dorset Explorer. And what we've been finding is that paths are marked as closed. And um the tip we know that the tier rampers do get the advice of um TR temperature traffic regulation orders. Um they expire and nothing changes. So there's a bit of a mismatch there. But I, I suspect that traffic regulation orders are probably highways and not yours. And it's how that information yeah, gets relayed to Dorset Explorer. Yeah, I mean, sometimes we request them, but yes, we yeah. don't do the yeah. processing. But uh, I'm still fine to say that, that, that about the issue of the TTRO is made, put on Explorer, yeah. but then not removed. Yeah, when, when it expires, when it yeah. Expires. Yeah. And also, I think I think it works uh, the opposite way around as well, that, that some paths that are subject to closure don't get put, don't get put on. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> is it actually possible for us to look at the NM? document see the breakdown of what the problem is. Like a whole list of them. Mm. See why not? Do we just need to log into something on the on the website or short sure, no, because I just see the the, the, the work facing part Yeah, of it. I mean I can go into it. See it the internal one as well. I mean, I think when we came back before, um, the total number of MNTs in each prioritised category was Russ was going to get back to us on that. Um, that was when we originally he was so you pass that one on to Russ, so we're just waiting for him to come back. That was the total number of MNTs in each prioritised category. So you could at least get a feel for okay. and then it was a spreadsheet detailing all MNT numbers, subject date submitted, priority allocation and action. It was felt it was just too unwieldy with 55 pounds. Yeah, and I mean, this is sometimes with the questions that came through. You know, I've obviously answered the questions literally as they were asked. Mm -hmm. they, it's possible that wasn't the question you were asking or, or, <laughs> or the answer right. that you wanted. Okay. Um, so I can get a better understanding. If I report fault on that door, and then everybody else reports a fault on that door yeah. from this room. How many NMTs is that? Is that one or ten? It would be ten initially, but it would be ten initially. But there's right. a duplication. One thing we did introduce mm -hmm. a little while ago, because this this does happen, although perhaps not that. Mm -hmm. Doesn't make the numbers that. Big, but um, we've added a duplication system so mm -hmm. that it, they would all be conflated into one. Right. OK. So that gives a, a better understanding. One thing I am aware, about 20 years ago, there was a cross dorsey ride by a group of young riders. And they listed, they did a sort of right away health check. And it, easy to find, easy to follow, easy to use. Way marking vegetation, that sort of thing. And a lot of the problems on those bridleways 20 years ago are still there today. And me, especially if it's a gating issue, which you'd have thought would be fairly easy to mm. repair and replace. Uh, vegetation, yes, it continues to grow. But where there is something that long on the system, 
that is highlighting a major issue with capacity on your department. And I do note that you are using a lot of the staff to maintain verges and roundabouts. What proportion of the time are they doing that during the summer when we've got the growing season for the bridleways and the mm. footpaths? Do they spread their, their wisely or are they focused on, should we say, manicuring Dorset for the tourists rather than attending to the residence issues from getting to A to B? Yeah. Um, they're not, they're not manicuring it for the tourists, that's for sure. Um, the, I think one thing that's important to note is that each team, so a few years ago when rights of way were a separate entity, the total number of people doing practical work on the on rights of way was six from Lyme Regis to Christchurch. Um, now the teams have got five of the teams have got six members of staff in each team. So we're talking about a, a total totally in, massive increase in magnitude of actually the staff we have available. So it's not, it would not be right to say because we're cutting verges, nothing's happening on rights of way. It might be that what's probably more accurate is in November, there might be six people in each of all 30 new kinds of private five teams working on rights of way. Where in June it might be two people in each of those teams working on rights of way. Two people um, across five teams is still ten, yes. um, where it used to be six. Okay, so in some ways there's an improvement there. There is an improvement. There's a vast improvement for the majority of the year, and where it isn't, where we have got other pressures in terms of verge cutting, for example, then um, we are sort of as we were, it was not an improvement. In addition to that, we have apprentices and volunteers. And across the service as a whole, we have 20 volunteers out Monday to Friday every day. This is almost a, um, a, a, of the workforce involved in this, as well as as well as managing countryside site, parks, etc. But um, 60 full-time staff in total, 20 plus 20 volunteers, 80. So about a quarter of the boots on the ground we have doing work are volunteers. And those volunteers are within the within the vehicles, within the teams, they're using chainsaws, brush cutters, driving vehicles, using chippers. They're all qualified up to national standards to use all of that equipment. So it isn't just someone walking around with a pair of secateurs, perhaps, it's somebody fully kitted up in a uniform with the permanent members of staff. Do you let parish councils know when you're working in the area so they can enhance your teams? You know, if you say you're doing right wing under 10 yeah. and high, you can list local support? I'd say generally not. Mm -hmm. um, we do work with the ROLOs, the rights where liaison officers in the parish, some of which are yeah, more active than others. Mm -hmm. Um, lots of the rights of way work is for two or three people. If you're, you know, repairing a bridge or installing a gate, repairing a style, there is a limit to how many people you can have which can be actively engaged in that. Um, so generally our work, you know, three people, you may have one that's a member of staff, one that's an apprentice. You mentioned styles there. I reported a number of styles that were hopefully not to be damaged, and your team came round and they repaired them. Only. <laughs> yes. <laughs> when they repaired them, they didn't look at and think, can we at least improve this style? I mean, I don't think it should be styles at all, but can we improve it so that somebody who isn't six foot ten and a marathon runner can get over it? Mm. Do they look at that style and think, gosh, this was badly done in the first place. Can we make it that poor Miss Harper, who's having trouble getting your style these days, could actually manage it? I would say yes. That's right. very much what we should be doing. OK. And I um, do, we are doing, but obviously not in this. this yeah, it's a 
long haul for a yeah. pair of legs that's only 29 inches long. And I think nowadays I couldn't do it at all. So, yeah. So I think that's something that. Yeah. I, I actually have a look, I look at a couple of weeks ago again. You know, which is which is had recently repaired. I I, I reported it's broken and it was it was fairly rapidly um put to new step in. But but it was um the, the step was more than knee high, which was uh, very difficult. Um it was uh, over knee high, sorry. Over, over knee. I mean, we do use the rich standard um of the styles as our blueprint for The structure and sometimes landowners do it. So landowners sh should do it, but often they don't, and we do a lot of it. Uh, and you're pretty sure that it's it was the Dorset Council team who fixed it. Oh, they got back to me and said they have. I haven't. That's <laughs> definitely one of ours. Oh, just follow um, the Calvary store round set. There is a deck for a guy who document those issues several years ago on opening up the countryside to people with disabilities in the light of the Equality Act. And it effectively says something along the lines of, yes, when a defective structure is being looked at, the default assumption should be to make it more widely accessible. But out of what you were just saying, I, I, I wonder to what extent your processes are actually doing that. And you might want to go back to that guidance yeah. and say, well, yes, are we using it as proactively as we can? Yeah. So we do definitely, every year, there are more gates put in to replace styles. But whether we could do more on that. There's a couple of couple of barriers. One is landowners who are less than they are styles because styles are particularly gates, which has worked well. Gates obviously obviously are much more expensive, um, especially the steel sense wire ones, much more expensive than styles. So that if we did it. Uh, on mass, there, there would be a. But yeah, no, I take your point. The so, yeah. So, do you ever look at the possibility? I mean, obviously, it would have to be with landowner's permission, but if it's your land, thing, which. Do you gaps as well. Yeah. Are you doing gaps as well? Which is obviously the first the first line of defence um, on the well, British Well, yes, yeah, so there's no maintenance for a gap, yes. uh, apart from the vegetation, of course. So. Yeah. That is, uh, and we do that, but I think what we're talking about is, so all of those things we do do, and I agree with you. I think what you're asking is, you know, can it be expanded? Could we do it more? Probably. For, I mean, we, you were talking about uh, the, 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 the surface on the, the, the little trail or whatever, and um, and I was looking at the pictures and I was thinking, my God, surely all blagging ways shouldn't be a quagmire that nobody can get their Wellingtons through. Yeah. Um, I mean, so there should there's, there is a standard, isn't there, for the, the terra yeah. firma? So there is a minimum standard. And uh, part of the issue is with the, with, the, with the presentation we had earlier, was that when I've gone and walked it with councillors, it's been spring, lovely. And it has been, everyone's kind of said, well, you know, this is actually quite a good right away. Yeah. Um, but obviously, there's some yeah. pinch points which are a real no, problem. But I'm saying so there is a standard across all bridal ways, because I know we're going to talk about that. So, so all bridal ways, there is a standard. And if you walked it, you wouldn't accept that it should be a different higher or yeah, it shouldn't be a deep water. water. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. But but of course, <laughs> what's a deep bog mire in February might be a perfectly sightable, even a pushchair friendly surface in 
June uh, once it's dried out and baked hard. Yeah, but what, what if somebody wants to use their mobility scooter or pushchair or short boots yes, in, in January? January. Yeah. I mean, or even bicycle. Yeah, then, then that, that is an issue. Uh, and it's about whether it is, you know, passable and usable. Um, and of so course, you know, as some uh, I've even had feedback from some equestrians who use that route, just use that example at Fiddle Valley, who said it is perfectly fine as a ride away 12 months a year. And we don't want hard surfaces which are, uh, no. are not so good for our horses. We don't want an urbanisation of the countryside by stone surfacing where we're enjoying some natural countryside. Mandy, you've been waiting patiently. Accept my apologies, please. You can come on. It's all right, but don't worry. I know it's like when you're in the room. Thanks for that. Um, Giles, I just wanted to um to say first of all, um, in I can only speak for for myself and my local area. The team do an amazing job. Um, we reported um quite substantial uh, footpaths around Longham Lake. Um, we're getting very overgrown. Um, and two weeks later, they are super clear, super wide, very, very excellent job done by the team. So um, generally, um, certainly in my experience, we've always had great service from the team at, at Avon Heath, so that's great. Um, but I wanted to ask a question, please, and this kind of links back to... ...and Vanessa's team. What I want to know is, according to Natural England's um, rule book, if you like, um, which literally I read it word for word, a surveying authority can make a modification order without receiving an application. The authority has a duty to keep the matter close review and where it finds evidence which that needs to be amended, it should take action. Um, and, and rather interestingly, and I don't know if you know um, the Longham area very well, but or, or if you've ever been to Longham Lakes, but Longham Lakes is a, a massively popular um, leisure um, locate, you know, uh, done now. And there is an old path, a public right of way, which leads all the way around the lakes, or almost all the way around. Um, but the key entrance points to that public right of way are not public right from the highway i mean so you've got short sections of track which are from the lead from the highway to the existing public right of way and they are not actually public rights of way believe it or not everybody was very shocked to find that out and interestingly enough you know, when the team comes to clear the official public footpath they use that track to, ex to access it um, and similarly, there's another entrance point to the official public right of way, which is across a pub car park, the King's Arms, and the clearance teams park in the King's Arms, and you know, so they're using that that stretch to get from the highway to the footpath, and then so they're using the exact same stretches of um, track, straight car park, to to get to the footpath that the general public are using. And yet, when we talk about designating those tracks and, and sort of entrances as public right of ways, we're told that we've got to submit a definitive map modification order with dozens and dozens and dozens of evidence forms and signed maps and all the paraphernalia. So I think my I'm finding it quite interesting that it says that Dorset Council should be proactively um, keeping the map under review and where it finds evidence that the map should be modified, it takes action. So, yeah, sorry, Joel, did all that make sense? Yes, I think so. I mean, I think it's a, a question more for Vanessa, unless I've missed something. I mean, what I'd just say about my teams are, it seems that they're accessing the right of way through what we would call a permissive route, which I'm guessing the landowner is happy for the public to to use, even if it is not definitive right of way yeah that's correct um but my my question i suppose is while your teams are out doing you know doing their thing and clearing these paths are they kind of thinking oh hang on a minute you know this this bit 
you know, because the, the, the challenge we have is that there's a couple of tracks that do enter the lake, but one in particular at, at some point in, in the recent past was under threat of um, somebody blocking it off because they, um, they wanted to use it for car parking and actually the land isn't owned. So it would be in a very nightmarish, um, you know, legal battle. Um, so it was just an observation, really, that while your teams are out on the ground, because the authority does have the duty to keep the map under review, your teams, I guess, out on the ground are probably the most obvious people to be doing that. In my, yeah. and that's how I was seeing it. And I think I know something a little bit about this. It, um, and, and this, I think, my the, the team did then pass on the methodology of how it's dedicated to the right of way, i.e. the forms. Yeah, exactly. But what I'm saying is Natural England's guidance says the authority could, should make modifications orders without receiving an application where it finds evidence that suggests a, a right of way should exist. So yeah, okay. I'm just saying, I, I, kind I of, it just seems there. to be being pushed back on the public I when, see. Yeah. see what I'm, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, but I, I don't know if just because that permissive route is available, that shows that is some evidence to demonstrate that it should be a right. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're right, uh, Mandy, we, we do have that role, and that's something that's being picked up in the road. <clears throat> with regard to Longham, um, it was yourself that raised the planning application, wasn't it? It was coming up with the, the renovation of the pub and the parking. That's yeah. right. And then, as I said at the beginning, I responded that in my other capacity with planning applications. Um, so put in the voice of the land. It goes up to the land by the pub and then there's a bit of no man's land to the highway. It doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. So I, that's been endorsed through that planning application on, on this instance. Um, I don't know, Nessa's still, but I know that. Vanessa, are you still there? Because if she's not, I can. Yeah, yes, Nessa. I'm still here. Yeah. yeah. I was just saying, I was going to just fill in about our conversation. So Vanessa and I have been working on the rights way improvement plan and looking at legal team and, and where we're at and how we might want to work in the future enhancing it. And continuous reviews come up there. And I know it's on it's on an action, isn't it, Vanessa? But do you want to just expand on that as you're here? Yeah, I mean, like Maddy, I completely understand your concerns. And I do also understand that having expecting the public to fill out an application form is it's a really big task it's a lot of paperwork and even though we offer help and assistance it can still be very daunting for people and I completely understand that um, which is why we do offer as much help as we can but we are tied by the legal process and as Giles quite correctly said the fact that there is a sorry <laughs> hit the wrong button um, the, as Giles said, the fact that there is potentially a permissive route, albeit an informal one on the ground, is not sufficient in the eyes of the law and the legislation that we have to adhere to for us to actually, as you say, proactively start recording that as a public route. We do actually need a significant amount of evidence, either documentary or user evidence, to be able to move forward. Our hands are tied. We can do make modification orders to record routes without receiving an application. That's correct. What we use, what that usually means for us as a team, is if we discover that there's an error on the definitive map, which is maybe error that we need to correct. A path is shown on the wrong side of the hedge or something like that. But we already have the evidence within the council to support the the idea that we can go out and look at things and see that they're desirable on the ground and they're used and it would make perfect sense isn't sufficient in the eyes of the law for us to actually make a modification in order to record that route it needs someone whether that's a member of the public or the parish council or a group that forms to actually gather that user evidence we as an authority can't do that we we simply don't have the capacity to basically stand by route, potentially for several years, and just sort of ask people how often they use it and how long they've used it for, and we don't have that kind of capacity. So, although the read out says 
consider without an application. That's absolutely correct. But we still have a fairly substantial amount of evidence to proceed. Thank you, Vanessa. Questions from the people on the, the remote working? Mandy, have you still got your hand up for? Yeah. Mandy, you're, is that a legacy hand as we're calling them these days? Yeah, sorry, yes, it is. All right, okay, fine. Um, just to go back to a few things, Giles, do any of the MNTs get timed out? No. No. So once they're on, they stay on, they don't it, come on. This is I think you I forget who wrote who wrote to me now. I think it was either through Tara. Yeah. yeah, it was the half of four. Yeah, it was the half of four. But so these there was a list of long questions, which I'm sorry I haven't got in front of me now. But that was one of the questions, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes. And I think I answered it that it was no. It's it's a definite no. And would there be any consideration of going to parish councils to see if they can give some form of snapshot about the ease of use of uh, public rights away in their parishes. Yes, it is something that we've to try and get a condition survey, mm -hmm. which is kind of a holy grail of knowing check. what we're really doing is it, having an effect. Mm -hmm. um, my thoughts were system which we make the best use of the Rolos and mm -hmm. try and get Rolos who are really keen to go out and do a survey of their parish would probably be our our best way of doing that. We had, and I spoke to Tara about sort of having a bit of a road show and going round the five geographical areas, um, getting that going and, and getting either, you don't just have to have one row though for each parish, you could have more to get a, a, a broader age range, broader interests, and to sort out that survey. Uh, COVID did put the mockers on that, but um, we're now coming out of COVID. Touch wood. So I think that is something that we need to look at. But I think probably we do have good relations with the parish councils, and I probably think that is the future of finding out that information. I can add to that, Giles. I think we, when we did um, the conversation for that going through the plan, prior to that, we've gone around all the very most because we our very low list was a little bit out of date. Yeah. We got started in previous years, so it's been all that. So that sort of came onto my part. Um, we went out and studied all the rollos and established who was still there and who wasn't, where the gaps are. It's part of the work process, it's what Charles is saying, and then we're going to sort of re we'll look at that moment, potentially yeah. revamp them. And obviously, we're going to be talking later on about the ROIP, yeah. but the ROIP is going to be highlighting some of the things that we really need to be focusing on in the next 10 years. Obviously, the, the uh, condition survey is one of those. Enforcement. What's the enforcement backup like? Is it effective where you have Landowners are saying you're not coming to build here, or they think that the, the rights of way is being either miscategorized or doesn't exist. How is your enforcement team? How many cases have you got live? How many have you resolved in the last year? Um, I don't know that just now. Was that one of the questions that was sent? That wasn't one of the it, it wasn't, but it's just something that's sort of come up. Yeah. Um, if you could give me a bit of, I can. Okay. Uh, I mean, if, if I come to the next laugh, if you mm -hmm. can furnish me, me with all the things that you'd like to know, then I'd have it at my fingertips. Right. Okay. But from your perspective here, if you gave a sort of snapshot answer, yeah. do you do you consider you have an in, a barbed enforcement team, or is it something that well, the enforcement team is the same as the, the ranger team? Right. Not to say. You don't pass it on to legal. We do pass it on to legal. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are not a rights away enforcement team. It is just legal. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, most of the time, it is okay. It, it, it is That's probably what I'm trying to get down yeah. to. Most of the time, it is effective. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's to do with one thing that senior rangers are good at, I find. I mean, having that smaller geographical area mm -hmm. means that they know a lot of the landowners personally. Mm -hmm. And therefore, mixture of cajoling, mm -hmm. um, um, a, as well as some enforcement letters, um, involvement with the Rolo, 
it's almost enforcement is not just about legal. Enforcement is actually getting the problem solved. Yes. And therefore, you need different strategies and different scenarios. Mm -hmm. And I think overall, we're good at choosing the tools that we have available, mm -hmm. all the way from being um, helpful and and encouraging to legal action. Well, in most situations, I am. I, I won't name the issue on on camera, but I'm aware of there is a bridal way that is, shall we say, virtually impossible to use because of a continuing situation with the landowner that has been ongoing for many, many years. And that is something that needs resolution. But I won't go into the case here because mm -hmm. I think it would be very unfair to do so. But it may be something we can take up privately. If you could give me the specifics. I will be interested. And also, if I'm invited to the next lap, any specifics on information right. you'd like. Because I, I did come here today, sort of just as a general absolutely information, then I'm more than happy to come and give a presentation or, or to give you the exact detail. And finally, I know it's going to be the next item, multi-use, but there are a number of issues regarding multi-use where, and I'll give you a specific, the Castle Main Trail, mm. which seems to be, there seems to be an emphasis on cycling rather than horse riding. There's barriers on the trail that prohibit horse riders, and there's a sort of grey area where there's a belief amongst riders that they should be on it, and it's difficult to get on it. How can we make sure all these trails and new cycleways are going to be available for horse riders to, to comply with the government's own active travel strategy on multi-use? Mm. So all the multi-use routes, which are bridal ways, and obviously the horses Absolutely. are on them. And so, for example, when trail was, Trailway was mentioned earlier, be it in North Dorset or uh, Mm -hmm. Nader Newton or various other trailways, um, horses are allowed on them. So mm -hmm. very keen on that to happen. Um, I think even on the Kessel Trailway, um, five sections of that are available for the riders. There are issues where there are key barriers, for example, the Willet Arms, when the Willet Arms, there's a key barrier just beyond there that would be very easy to take down. And there are other stretches of the Castle Main Trail which are totally eminently suitable for mm. equestrian use, but currently aren't. And there's a frustration, especially as we've got Sustran saying these paths are available for everybody, paths for everyone policy, and we don't want to be behind the curve when the rest of the community is hearing that they should be open to everybody. And on the ground, we find sadly they're not. And also new routes are going out. Um, I'll give you an example, the six new cycling corridors which will incorporate some bridleways around Christchurch Pool in Bournemouth mm. and I've written to the active travel team or the transforming travel team and you get a very vague answer and when you say are they available they, they don't say they are they don't say they aren't well I'm telling people who come to me well, the government strategy towards active travel, section six, includes horse riders. Go out and use it. We, we have far too many incidents on the road where horses and riders are injured because of um, issues with large lorries and fast cars, particularly passing too narrow. So we need to have user groups kept safe off road. Mm. So my personal advice is use it. And also, yeah. in, in addition, in those trailways, I've got barriers in that are preventing horse riders, then inevitably they'll prevent people on mobility scooters mm. as well. And yeah. Since uh, there's an inequality duty. To I, I agree. And, and we've just done a, a big refurbishment of the Castleman Trailway between Thurwood and um, Thurwood and Ringwood. And um, we've taken out all the 
all those barriers. They were there. And uh, we've removed them. We had some criticism that that will allow motorbikes to get on, for example. And we've and we've held the line that if it is more open and available to everybody, there'll be a greater element of self-policing. And actually that lack of, of, of mud and poor uh, surface that we did have, it's actually much less, my experience of, of improving uh, old railway lines is that an improved surface means it's much less attractive to motorbike users. And we haven't had a, an issue since we've since we've taken out those barriers. So I'm, I'm quite keen for it to be as open and usable as many as possible. That section is all owned by Dorset County. Uh, five and a half kilometres we've just done. That is excellent news and thank you very much. Any further questions, anybody? Well, thank you very much indeed for turning up, Giles. And I know your team is under a lot of pressure because um, one of your officers did come to a British Horse Society Access team meeting. And he was very forthright and candid about the issues he has and his team have. And we greatly appreciate the dialogue and the better understanding we have, because I do know you've got limited resources. And yeah. You're doing the very best you can. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Here. I think it is fair to say that uh, managing the rights of way you could almost have infinite resources because there's more rights of way than there are um, carriageway roads in, in Dorset. And we'd all like to see them managed to a much higher standard. What I'm very content with is that the teams are pushing those boundaries, both with external income that we're, we've been successful in getting, such as that, that active travel for the Castleman mm -hmm. Trailway, spent £180,000 on that or externally. Um, so that that maintenance of the asset that we've got and the improvement of the asset that we've got, we we are we are pushing the boundaries of what can be achieved, and we are we are I feel doing a good job. But of course, there's always more to do. We don't get everything right, and more resources would be a huge help. That's for sure. Undoubtedly, <laughs> right. Um... I was going to say, yes, we'll, we'll have a convenience break, comfort break, and start back at 12 o'clock. Thank you very much, everybody. See you in 10 minutes.
Right. Right. Thank you, everybody. We will resume back with item number six, which is multi use fruits. Now, before us, we have a paper that has been prepared by. Um, I, actually, I have a working group with a number of people from the forum, and there are a number of bullet points here. Now, unfortunately, today, Wayne Sayers has given his apologies. So really, this we would like to defer to the next meeting. Um, one thing that I would like, however, is there a multi-use policy from Dorset Council? Because you must be working some policy when you put down routes in the past. I mean, basically, basically in the previous row, it was when we were looking at rights of way where possible without um, compromise of farming users we would enhance use. So, you know, we were always trying to future proof, think forward and make sure that, you know, we're providing a good strategic network for all users across Dorset and that that would then break off into the wider Dorset areas of which you get a different experience. But that's the ultimate aim. And that's <clears throat> being carried on into Rev2 um, and also looking at the policy and, and reviewing and, and working around that. And also in light of that, and what you've already commented on about actually the inclusion of equestrians and some of those issues there and how the two networks so you've always got with rights of way, a green highway network, and then perhaps with the cycling app to travel a more grey urban network. It's how they perhaps can interact and overlap. So, so I was going to add to that. But that's the sort of where we come from within the rights of way line. Yeah. I mean, definitely on our conversation with Sustrans, who have been funding things, had it as a, as a red line that if, if, if they do want to uh, develop this project and just have questions. Um, I mean, there may be some situations, I, I don't quite know how broad you mean by the active travel cycle infrastructure, because some of it is, you know, um, metal roads adjacent to dual carriageways and things like that. So it might be difficult to have a blanket um, policy, because I think there are specifics within each one which either make them more suitable for horse uses or, or less so? Yeah, obviously, with your carriageways, horse riders are going to risk assess it and not want to go there. Um, there have been instances where we have had major road improvements where we've had an active travel corridor alongside, and that is for all non motorised users, including equestrians. But I'll give you a specific. I didn't want to really go into specifics this morning. Um, not half a mile from where we're sat, there's a small section of cycle walkway going down to the pub, Charminster. And you've got horse warning signs on a very narrowed piece of road. And adjacent to it, you have a cycle walkway, which would be eminently suitable for equestrian use. And yet, from my visualization, horses are being put on the road rather than on the safe, non motorized space. And I just can't see the reason for it. Is that a route you're familiar with? Uh, yes, well, I know it, mm -hmm. but it is not within my team's room. Okay, so that would be in, that would be for Wayne. So, yeah. Okay. Best if we just note the report today that we've seen it, we've read it through before we came here. And in advance of the meeting, I would like to see the multi use policy that Dorset do have in the past. And we will await uh, Wayne when he returns for our November meeting. Janet, you'd like to. Yeah, I, I did have, as you can see, I've scribbled mm -hmm. various notes on that. Who was the author of this? Yeah. Oh, well, I'll email you then. Right. I've got some questions, but I'm, I'm okay. we're going to discuss it properly. We, we have a working group. Yeah. Yes. OK, that's fair enough. Um, so we will now move on to item seven, which is access land. Research and conclusions. Jim. 
Would you like to speak to this item? Hello, yeah, sorry. Uh, hello, everybody, just unmuting there. Um, am I permitted to share my screen or can somebody bring up the, not that one, if it's possible, There's an, there was another um, item in it, which is more helpful to look at. I do have documents available here if I'm permitted to share the screen. Sorry, Jim, you're not able to uh, share your screen. I do have it. Okay, thank you. OK, I'm just going to go through this as succinctly as possible, because I know many people have have seen past iterations of the study. Um, so we'll try and get through to the main part of it as quickly as possible. Um, so if we can go on to the next one. this So this, just to give a brief summary, this is a study that's um, gone about um, identifying areas of open access land which have no legal rights of access to them because um, there's no connecting um, rights of way so they're inaccessible island sites um, if you go to the next one please uh, so the first stage was kind of firstly identifying where these are around dorset and then if you can go to the next one going through a process of looking into these sites, uh, starting to gather data on them, such as the area, any other designations, where nearby rights of way are, uh, and to kind of build up a picture of what the value of connecting them into the public access network would be, and the feasibility of doing so. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, great, this one, yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, we, we're kind of this is being done with the idea of um, identifying a series of prior, higher priority sites which seem to offer the most value and the highest level of feasibility to connecting into the public access network with the idea that um, this list of priority sites can be handed over to Dorset Council and that this information goes to supporting um, the work that Tara is undertaking with the ROIP. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so from a total of about 38 sites that were originally identified, this was kind of whittled down to a list of about 23, which seemed to warrant further investigation. And on further investigation, there's identification of about nine sites, well, of nine, exactly nine sites uh, distributed across the county. Can we go back a slide, please, quickly? Thank you very much. And uh, so the sites that have a green ring around them on this map are those that have been identified as priority sites. So as you can see, they are spread across the county, um, but uh, generally concentrated more in the west and the north and all sites are situated within a or m b designated areas okay if we can jump forward to now that would be great um i don't know if there's a necessity to go through each site in this meeting but i'll just explain uh what's been done within this document and hope that most people have had an opportunity to look at it um so for each a uh, priority site that's been identified. We provide a link to it on Dorset Explorer and information about its size and notes about its value and its feasibility for connecting into the network. And then if you go to the next slide, please, this is for each site um, overmarking the plans, overmarking the maps uh, with ideas for potential routes that would link these open access island sites into existing public rights away also with any other supporting information such as um, where existing gateways are or existing parking areas or existing um, public access uh, points such as our bus stops uh, public transport uh, points so this this process is repeated for for the nine sites um, 
which you could just flick through. I won't talk about them, but if, if you um, keep going, that'd be great. And then just for completeness, once we get to the end of the nine sites, um, there's just uh, further information on some of the other sites that weren't selected, uh, which you can just keep flicking through. I won't talk specifically about any of them. Um, so, you know, it's been a bit of a multiple stage process that's gone on for quite some time, this piece of work, but I think the stage that we're at now is to have these nine priority sites that we are have selected and that we would like to um, put this forward now to Dorset Council to consider. Uh, so I guess the outcome we're looking for today is to kind of have that uh, finally reviewed and approved across the forum. Okay, I mean, I'm happy to talk about any of it more at greater length, but obviously know that we're under time pressure for the rest of the meeting. So if, if that's okay for everybody like that, I'll, uh, I'll put, put that to any comments, please. Yeah. Can I just congratulate Jim and whoever worked with him on this on a really excellent piece of work. Mm -hmm. There's been so much effort put into this. So. Based on an absolute magnificent place of work. I know we're interested to second guess what they've been doing at a micro level. Um, what would be really shameful, given the effort that's gone in, today, if we can't get the councils and natural England to pick up the ball and run with it? And I I think particularly we need to understand where we are based upon natural England. But natural England are the open access mapping authority. And we've also established that fairly recently that they do have some form of power. These so I say I think we do need to make it quite apart from what China can do with the lack with the rowing. We do need to make a pitch to natural England, saying how much importance we attach to this and um, please can they say clearly what they can do in as a response. I was going to just say, because I'm going to see Jim and um, Chris, like they say, it's fantastic bit of work, it's been really helpful to me, and obviously we're going to pull this into the road and then that more detail on how we, in the um, action plan, the delivery plan, how we're then work with that in enhancing access, allowing and access to it. Um, and as you also know, we're very close to the Natural England and the Open Access team, um, and I flagged this bit of a search up to them, and they're really interested in that. The situation in Natural England hasn't changed. The focus is now on the Eden Coast Path. So that, as I said in the previous report, the um, review of access land has been deferred and that still stands and there's no update on that. But um, but I have also had discussions with them about the role that Natural England can play in dedication and creation of routes to access land. So they are fully aware of this. Um, but of course, if the last want to write and report that as well. But like I said, they're fully aware of it. and. And I've sort of spoken, well, by email with Jim about some of the points and some of the things I wanted to come back on and get some more information back for the ROIC, but that I was putting this forward to Natural England. So, so they are aware of it and they're very interested in it. Um, so that link is made, yeah. Right, we have a very clear recommendation made by you, Jim, which I'm happy to move from the chair to approve the further and final identification of priority sites as contained in the report review of open access land island sites stage three priority sites review issue Dorset council um would you like to second that jim as you're the author of the report yeah certainly yes. yeah would yeah so all those in favor Yes. If you're in support. Be... 
right hands down. Any against? And any abstention? I have one abstention. I'm abstaining because I'm still on the middle on the learning curve. It's fine. So we have one abstention. OK, thank you very much. That's the witch half of Panbury monkey jump. So Tara, over to you. So basically, um, I mean, basically it says it all in the report, and so hopefully you will have a chance to read it. Uh, there's potentially an opportunity to improve access as part of the improvements to the roundabout here. Um, basically, when they developed Hanbury, they wanted to, they were aware that there might be bottlenecking of traffic on the roundabout. And so the focus is very much about how to alleviate that. So they're looking at additional lanes and approaches to the roundabout to facilitate the um, movement of traffic through there. So they are looking at various improvements, and these might be perhaps side lanes and crossing points for walkers and cyclists around the drive. Walk my Martinstown direction. <clears throat> and I was asked just to comment with the mind of enhancements for walkers, riders and cyclists. Uh, and as you can see in the report, I picked up on a couple of issues. We've got a footpath that's um, severed by the A35 and also a bridleway. Um, and the bridleway in particular that does sever the route from one side of the land to the other, where there's particularly strong areas of right away network. So, um, I've got, gone in and asked for the Pegasus Crossing, which would benefit all walkers, cyclists, and um, horse riders, obviously, in connecting those two areas, and also people within Panbury and the Mile, Mile and Postal Dive, and also the other there. So, it was really just showing you the proposal that I was submitting back and seeing if you, were, if you had anything to add to it. Um, you know, if there's any further enhancements that you think that we could request, endorsement of it, um, any additional opportunities you see. Also, as you can see at the, bottom, at the top, I do say about evidence and demonstrating need. Um, I stress that at every meeting or whenever any of these issues or enhancements come up, especially with um, national highways, evidence of need is critical. A lot of the time, the people doing this work will go out on site and look to see if there's evidence, so let's see if there's an equestrian or cyclist or walker. They like to see if there's any marks in the ground or the verges. And more often than not, they'll come back and say that there's no evidence of need. And often user groups will come back and say, well, they were out there at the wrong time of the day. Or, as with the A35, effectively, you, you have a brick wall. So a lot of people won't use that bridleway network because they're just too frightened to negotiate traffic. So, and then often it comes back, there's a perceived fear, but actually it's quite a, a real fear. And road severance, as you know, was a big issue on our previous road, but it's also quite a high one now on our second one. So getting that evidence is always really hard. Um, but if there is any evidence of need, local equestrians, walkers or cyclists, um, then please send that through to me. But in principle, it was just your views on the paper. If there's anything to add, anything to endorse it, I will be submitting it anyway. Um, but they are very well. I explained what the lap was uh, or is and what the work it does. And they are happy for you to either endorse this proposal, and I will put you in on that, and mention the lap of the Dorset, or you can also write your separate, separate one. There is quite a tight deadline, and I did say <clears throat> we're having a meeting today, and I will respond as soon as possible. Does anybody wish to comment? Again. So, okay. I, I have just already mentioned this to Tara. There is already um, an active um, diversion order for the footpath, which is footpath. 51 Dorchester footpath 6 Winterbourne Moncton, which crosses the A35 south east of the Monkey Jump roundabout. Um, it's quite a significant diversion, which is going to take people away from having to cross the A35 on the level, taking you through a tunnel further to the southeast again. Um, but I think Tara needs to take that into account in this wider improvements in this area which I think we will be really pleased to hear about um, and well if if um, money is being spent on improving the monkey jump roundabout then this is the time to get in the pleas for non-motorised non users while the money's being spent so yeah more power to your elbow Farah.
Any further comments? Cool. Yeah, some of them there now. This the monkey jump land about is an absolute no go area. What pedestrian question, what have you? And if they're going to bring up only down to three shafts, it is to be a starting point for this about. It's going to be in the works. And so to provide remotely safe crossing facilities for non motors is going to cost an arm and a leg. So the question is, please, where does the budget for all this come from? Or do we have to persuade that it's worth spending an extra couple of hundred thousand? It's a national highway scheme, but they work very close with Dorset Council. So Dorset Council, um, so my comments will feed into that, and then they will have final sort of recommendations working with national highways as to what should or shouldn't be built into the scheme. And, you know, I'm under no sort of misunderstanding that asking for the Pegasus Crossing is probably asking beyond the realm of the funding, but it's asking that would be the most suitable yeah. traffic planning for the site. Um, and also in talks with them about how they actually tackle facilitating movement of you know non motorized users around that roundabout which they will take on board. So we can submit this and then basically it will be discussed internally by them that be and then the final step will be determined. So we may not get anything. And one of the things is when you go out on site there's grass verges so so along the Brickport Road, from the roundabout up towards that bridle way, um, I know that there's talk of working with those verges for non motorized users. So, for example, it might be that you can facilitate a cyclist off the roundabout itself, but then back onto the main road further up. And so, from my perspective, I was saying well, we can extend that verge at least up to the bridle way, because then that at least you know extends any sort of um, connection and making cyclists who don't want to be on the main road. And then safely access the bridle way as much as that Pegasus crossing will allow the pressure to cross that road. So there's a budget for this, and we just asked, we're just basically highlighting all the enhancements possible for the user, and then we hope and try to make sure the case, and we hope they can facilitate it. I mean, you've got five roads on and off this roundabout. If you want to allow people in town to get across to the Southwest side of the A35, they're going to have to cross at least two of them, aren't they? So, when when you say a Pegasus crossing, you presume in Pegasus crossings is plural. No, I mean, it, it sort of does explain in the report that basically that there's a desire line that they have picked up on the path that goes across, and it's more about then having a sort of um, safety refuge like they do now. So that's what the highways are sort of working on. Um, they talk about the third lane approach and how it'd be wide to allow those three lanes and about the reserves and so there will be sort of safety areas, refuge areas. The Pegasus crossing is a sort of additional one we've asked for to link that right away, which currently is just severed by the A35 on the Brickport Road. Is it the um, wait, is it the, the, the highways um what you call it uh, fund? Especially when when bridleways and footpaths are severed. Yeah, well, that's historic. So that would be in conjunction with the road build. And then also that's the other one we're tapping in with. So which I'll come to in the road where we asked in the survey for the priority crossings that are severed by the um highways, national highways, road yeah. trunk roads, and that if we could come up with one priority at least, we could then put a bid into that funding. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean this this is basically you know, all being handled by uh, national highways and then their feedback on their finances to Dorset Council. So we are literally feeding in. And these are the comments that, um, when I looked at it, I felt could be there to enhance the network. So if there's anything addition or if you do endorse it, I mean, Janet's flagged up about that right away, which wasn't um, flagging up on our system. So I have picked up on that right away, but I will flag up on that by version order. Any further comments? Right, I've got a declarable interest here, obviously, because I'm the British Horse Society Access Officer of the South West. But I've got some statistics here that I can give you. 
you know, regrettably in the southwest, we have the highest number of recorded incidents between horses and traffic. The whole country. And Dorset figures, but in 2020 there were 11 reported incidents. In 2021 there were 36. So statistics are going the wrong way. Now, I know the site, I've had a look at it, and it's a, an absolute no brainer that you would put in some form of crossing point there. A Pegasus crossing, a button at a high level, so a mounted rider can just press the button to stop the traffic. If there were an incident there, and let's say somebody lost their life, we're talking about a million, 1.5 million, because that's what you determine a death on a road is these days. Now, I'm also aware of the great field in Hanbury, and one of the councillors pr proudly told me that it was open for equestrian use, and you could ride around it, and the surface was very acceptable for horse riding. So, if you just want to ride around the great field, that's fine, but if you want to go out into open countryside, you've got to allow the rider to get out there and to access that right away. So it, it has to happen because right away severance is one of the key issues that we have. And it's putting a line in the sand that this is what we need, this is what we want for people to ride safely in Dorset, where roads sadly are getting busier. And they're getting busier because of increased highway schemes. And the cost that this will take to put in against the cost of the highway scheme. It's just the literal drop in the ocean, but it is so needed and so necessary because it would help all users. Any further comments, Dean? Several years ago now, we did produce a, a list of these round away severance cases. And I'm just wondering whether you have actually seen it, Phil, because it obviously raises the question of how do you prioritise this one relative to the others? But we came up with quite a long list of cases on the A35 and adjacent roads where a pair of round away zones pretty well useless because you just cannot say to get it wrong. And so this is this is in the same category. And it is just simply a question of prioritization. Right. Okay. There's prioritization. I agree with you. But I would say here is an opportunity. And we've got to grasp every opportunity we can. Okay, there may be others yeah. up and down the A35. Here is a heaven sent opportunity yeah. to get highways in or whatever they want, yeah. English, national highways, to do the work, saying, look, we have all these issues up and down the road, but please, 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 you know, there may be SIL money or one of, Section 106 money coming in future yeah. development, but do, yeah. do it now. Well, That's it would take one off the list. Wouldn't it? It would do. That, to, that we'd be applying for and do another mm. set of funding. Yeah, we can say, look, right on your doorstep where you're doing a highway improvement yeah. scheme. Don't do number one that's probably 10 miles down the road, which I say was too far away, but we can do this one within the remit of the scheme. Yeah. I'm trying to find a copy of that list and let you have it. Thank you. We do have a list of feeding it into the row because that's all part of that um, and comparing yeah. it. I can explain later, but yeah. So that? we would endorse that. So I'm happy to move from the chair. Nicola, second. So all those in favour? Hands going up on the screen. The screen is lighting up. Right, thank you. Um, I think that was unanimous, apart from one abstention. I'm going to abstain on the basis that I've only joined this panel and uh, 
far I was expecting, and maybe from North Dorset in this meeting today. And uh, it will do this. I spoke the last week. I'm going to declare something that interests so that you can learn something. Uh, firstly, I am a member of the MPs all party uh, working group in respect of the A35. And uh, clearly, as the ward member, Barnford Vale, which includes Chile, uh, clearly I have an interest in the A35 uh, and uh, safe cycling, safe walking, safe horse riding uh, elsewhere on the A35. You will hear much more about that on subsequent. Thank you very much indeed, Simon. Thank you. And of course, I know Janet and myself, we attended the North Dorset Garden Community Workshop, and there was an emphasis on bringing in non motorised use, including horse riding. So it's it's all sort of going around the periphery of, Dors of Dorchester that we're trying to encourage and maintain equestrian use. Thank you. Right, we will now move on to item number nine, which is the DLAF planning working group. Over to you, Janet. Right, OK, thank you. Sorry, you only got this report uh, very late on, uh, but it is very short and I hope you had time to read it. It really came from something which Tara suggested, which was that the LAF might like to consider uh, setting up a planning group to look at planning applications which concern public rights of way and uh, commenting on them. Um, now, this is something quite close to my heart because uh, the Rounders have been trying very hard to get directly consulted about planning applications rather than having to sit in front of the planning website and trying first try and make the best guess to any which might impact on rights of way. And, and we have now, we are now in the position where we are being consulted on all of the planning applications on which the rangers are consulted and, and Tara and herself. But that is an awful lot of planning applications, most of which you wouldn't want to pass comment on. Like the one I got yesterday, which was about the dropped curb. And, you know, we simply wouldn't have the time or the capacity as a lab to comment on all of those. Uh, so I gave it some thought. I think, well, it would be a good idea if, if the LAF was able to look at some planning applications. And the idea that I came up with was um, that applications which involve more than 20 dwellings, 10 dwellings, uh, plus large applications such as those for solar farms and for mineral extraction and waste facilities which tend to cover large areas of land uh, so so yes i think it would be a good idea for the to, for the lab to consider setting up a working group but there's a huge but about this i'm not sure how it would work in practice we only meet infrequently um so how would we decide whether or not there was consensus from across the entire lab as to the comments that the working group had decided should be made. Um, would you give us, um, would you um, allow us to make it and then um, ratify what we said later? Um, I don't know. So I really just did this for discussion following what Tara had suggested. Um, so I don't know what everybody else thinks about it. Is it something we've got a capacity to do? And who would, if, if so, who would like to be involved? But finally, and probably most importantly, is what kind of protocol would we operate to about deciding whether or not we were going to comment? I mean, if I just add to it also, I think it relates down to what we're talking about with work programmes and really that will happen in the future, <clears throat> making various policy decisions and sort of standards to sort of feedback. One of the areas was also planning on where the lab stands for the planning and developing their own policy or advice mode. Um, so when we do have sort of larger planning applications that in relation to what we're talking about. 
that you can get back with a standard response relating to how to the cycle. So you've got a standard one, but then there may be some of the standard ones where you want to or have the capacity to develop, you know, focusing mm -hmm. on some of the bigger ones. I mean, I've been talking naturally about this, obviously, um, nationally, with all the other lab bodies, and some of them aren't, you know, some of them will start to develop their planning possibly, but also looking at this, sort of setting up these sort of groups as well. And for those very reasons, because it's becoming such a big issue that's impacting on access, be that for leisure and or you know, the wider benefits that rights away bring. So, so yeah, I mean, it's like, right, it has to go down to that capacity. The advice to come back about the reputation. The line seems to be taken that if there was a group set up, and it tends to be that already the established lines like the Ramblers and people who are working for the fund groups and from the other organisations, but that it's that they have that capacity to make that response and then it sort of informs the designation of the confirmation from that. But in relation to that, it's that wider general guidance as well that would be good to start working on. Right. Um... I'll take the screen first of all. I saw Jim with his hand up first. Would you like to come in, Jim? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I just want to say that I kind of feel that this is 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 an interesting area and an important role that we can have. I, I agree with, with Janet's words on that completely. Um, and it is something that I would personally be interested in being involved in. I also agree one of the hardest things to see is how we can ensure we do reach a kind of consensus and whether there's a uh, out of meeting, you know, digital consensus that we can come to, of, you know, via collecting people's opinions over email, although obviously there's a there's the challenge of, of doing that within the necessary timescale to comment on the application. Um, I mean, it does seem if there's enough people that would be interested in doing it, it might be the kind of thing that a trial exercise might be necessary between you know between meetings or something so that we can we could potentially come back at the next meeting and say look the, the these are the things that, that didn't work about our efforts or these these are this is the way we think we need to proceed in order to make the exercise feasible it kind of seems like one of those things that might need a bit of a trial run to see how it might work and whether it can work kind of at all Okay, thank you. And Fiona, you've got your hand up as well. Yeah, it seems to me there are two. I think it's a very good idea that because it's quite hard to do in an ad hoc way, which is how I look at things at the moment. So that on the one side, the the who, if each organisation that has a different type of access, like the Ramblers, a, a cycle group, actually have a, a form a network who can compare and, and ensure that we all see the same applications, then that will speed it up for all of us. And within each organisation, for instance, down in the BHS, we could get, if we had a single rep that was notified of, of, of schemes, we can pass them on to the area representative and then be responsible for passing it back up into the, uh, the LAF network or the council. The second thing is around the filtering. Um, existing rights of way is a great filter for the council to determine it needs point of view being raised but we, this is where we really need our ROIP map so we also know where the need for access is as well so that we don't miss opportunities uh, that might come up through the planning route in section 106 where there's a real gap in access or a problem to resolve um, so that ROIP map will be very handy for opportunities. Jim did you want to come back in there you have your hand up Sorry, I apologise. Legacy and okay, the... fine. That's not a problem. Thank Get you. you. Right. Um, I did the um, I did the, uh, the, the the response for the uh, BCP local plan, and and I mean I totally agree. I think we do need a group to do this, but it, it was noticeable that there really wasn't much said by anybody else when I circulated it. So you know I. <laughs> so, um, so, uh, but I, I still think we could do with a group. I think it would be great. Um, but obviously, it's got to be people who want to want to do it. I also haven't heard back from BCP that they've actually even 
down to acknowledge that they got it. Um, so, which is a bit worrying. Don't hold your breath. Uh, well, funny, I did. I did respond to Rambler. Yes, you did. And, and I got a something back to say that they've now published the second stage thing, moving on from what we commented on last. So um, I haven't had a thing. Oh. Not a thing. I haven't looked. I'll forward it to you. I mean, I, I have a sense of team now, even. I'll forward what I had to you. Right. I, I like giving ideas which I have a have a run and uh, have a part. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Oh, I had a quick look in the Secretary of State's guidance the other night. And there's a bit there that says, um, Forms can give advice on the recreation and access implications of individual planning applications. However, they will probably make the most effective use of their time by focusing on the relevant policies in the local development framework. So, the logic is once the council has got policies that we approve of, we are paying them to implement. And that also fits. With another bit of the guidance, which says we should be on the strategic level issues rather than individual cases, wherever possible. So, perhaps I can see where Janet and Carol are coming from. It would help if we could be more specific about in what is the system working now. Right. Shall we look at look at this from the other end of the telescope? Shall we? I presume, councillors, you get a weekly list of all the planning applications coming through, and the majors are identified with the letter M after the planning number. The answer is that ward members are notified of applications in respect to their ward. There isn't a right, so there would be. A combined weekly list somewhere that comes out. But no, it's a question of periodic notification. Right. Of application being registered within the council. Okay, um, I'm a district councillor in an area of North Devon, and we get a weekly list. But well, I appreciate Dorset is a unitary, and your wards will be a lot larger. Um, I don't know if there's a way of interrogating the system yeah. to highlight majors. Yeah, so basically 10 properties that are, are classified as a sort of major. Okay. Um, in the planning, in the indictment, basically it would be just people um, going back to the planning team and saying that last one we have a So I've got that technology and I just come up with that as well. Get from that England. So that's the goal to be where we have had policies in the past, we can see how they've been taken into account with the, the current ones going through the system. Okay. And we may wish to comment on but other policies. You look at the, the standard for planning application data, one of the standard consultations is IROM. And therefore, logically, if a development has high on an existing site has an impact on the right of way, then obviously highways should pick that up. It may be that not, but it, it just makes the point there is a system there. And it would be very helpful if we could be more specific about well. We can identify by seeing what's going through as they come up to look at what is current and going forward what is coming in to the planning system and just see, seeing how the policies we support and have recommended to the um the planning team and the local plans are being implemented yeah. and we can actually as a working group make recommendations i don't see why not what do we think, Janet? Well, it, 
Paul, it's not it's not high, the highways people who comment on rights of way. The ward, the senior rangers get consulted on the yeah. applications which impact on rights of way. And it, this isn't to be dismissive of, the, of what the rangers say. The rangers say there is a public right of way within so many metres of this development and put out a warning about it must have been interfered with, it's going to be necessary to divert this. But what the wardens don't really have the capacity to say, although on occasion they do, but very often that's the limit of what they say. And I, my thinking was, and I think it's Tara's thinking as well, is that any input from the lab would be over and above that very basic thing, this right of way is going to need to be diverted. It would be, there is actually another right of way 50, 50 metres away, and a really useful link could be made from this new estate to that public right of way, which would increase public access to the countryside from the new estate or whatever it is. That, that was my thing. Mm -hmm. well, 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 uh, yes. So my wider role now within planning is to do just that that Janet says. So, for example, there's a big planning proposal for development in one of our market towns, and it affects lots of rights of way, and that's been picked up. But it was then picking up how there was lots of severance by the A35 again, and how actually on this site we could put in the bridle way for multi use because the whole focus of the development was getting people into the town. But the thinking wasn't there about how those people might get out to the neighbouring um, coast corridor and another countryside. So, so my response is saying, well, hang on a minute, look at the wider network and how we can actually gain from that. And it's a similar thing from the last perspective, that wider sort of strategic overview. And presumably the output from our deliberations would be fed into the planning system as an objection. Well, you could either object or, or, you, or you comment. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, you're, you're not necessarily objecting to the principle of whatever it is that's being yeah. proposed. You're just putting in a comment that gets taken into account in the, the planning officer's uh, recommendation. So, and it, it seems to me the case with with larger uh, residential applications, there is a lot of discourse between the planning officer and the developer. And if he knows that that there are being suggested, if she knows there are suggestions about a link in the public right of way network, that's the sort of thing that he, he or she can be feeding back to the developer or the applicant. Right. So going forward. As we wrap this up, we want a working group to look at majors. I think it's a question of a form of words that describes the cases that we can briefly look at. I think, I think major applications which yeah. would encompass things like solar farms. That's so I think it's it should also include the provision of green space. Yes. Yes. Yeah. As well as but lights away. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we can comment on on a ad hoc yeah. basis. So we'll but uh, that that is part of their planning policies, that's the point. The, the, the natural policy plan, planning policy framework requires them to do that. Mm -hmm. So as part of their their job. So are we saying you're not doing it well enough? Well, we what's well, it paragraph one hundred, I think it deals with issues like right away yeah. in the NDPF. Yeah. So we can we can look to see, you know, we can be the critical friend, if you like, yeah. and make that challenge. Yeah, to scrutinize how it's going, what do we think? And that's that's something that your working group could look at within in terms of reference. I think so, yeah. Yes. I mean, I don't know. Can we we'll wrap this up now, really, don't we? It's something mm. to well and have an action point at least. Action point. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. Shall I work with Tara on putting together What's a that remit? Example? I mean, I've got Nicola, um, Janet, Jim, and Chris who have, who have said they were interested in, in working on this. So, I mean, if you want to pull together those thoughts from form and then we can. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, let's and just think that trialing. Let's say that. let's have that as a provisional group. And uh, we'll have some email exchanges yeah. and try and be able to report something back because the the notification will 
can't buy a Tara because she's already being notified. We're not going to be asking the plan department to notify anybody additional. It will be through Tara. Yeah. So do we need a formal recommendation or do we make that recommendation? Yeah. <laughs> no. Okay. Us, yeah. Well, yeah. I recommend I that we, we take forward the, the idea of a planning working group and um, we'll report back next time. Okay. Well, thank you um, to everyone who volunteered. I'm happy to second that. So just a brief show of hands. This, that's fine. I think bar one abstention will be unanimous. I'm going to abstain on this matter because I've only just joined. That's seat. fine. However, having been a former chair of a planning authority and having been previously a member of the West Dorset District Council Planning Committee and having dealt with a, a outline application for a very large site 40 miles west of here, I do have concerns that there will always be dissenting voices because it cast our mind back to that planning application. that you might have been happy with uh, arrangements in respect of um, book files and um, right ways etc and adjustments arising from that site but there will always be a dissenting voice who have never actually been able to reconcile themselves with book pay book path issues etc in relation to that site so there will always be a, 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 a dissenting voice so you'll end up perhaps with majority Decision as opposed to Dara's decision. That, that's acceptable within the terms yeah. of the council. So you always um, you know, to put sort of report the support given any abstentions or anything like that with that majority. Right. Um, moving on to item 10 access at Wild Woodbury. Over to you again, Jack. So it's me again. Um, Yes, um, many of you probably know that Dorset Wildlife Trust have obtained an area of land adjacent to the Regis, which is going to be rewilded. And they are intending to have public access elements to this new site. And um, I have had a conversation with the, the lead officer at Dorset Wildlife Trust about this and explained what the access forum is. And um, he said that he would be very happy to take me on a site visit. Um, so I just, I, I don't think he wants to take a coach load of people. But if anybody else, one or two other people would be interested in, I will put forward two or three names, go on a site visit to Wild Woodbury and see what access is being offered. Fiona, you've got your hand up. Um, it was a legacy hand. However, I've also done the site visit at Wild Woodbury um, for other reasons. And probably there is a probably rights uh, footpaths we discussed quite a bit when I was there. And it would be very useful for you to have a look, I'm sure. But there are horse issues there as well. So it would be good for us to invite someone local, perhaps, who rides there. And there's been some discussion about access down the, the lane, which there seems to be no objection to. But there are some problems about making it legal. So. Thank you. Right, so I think I might be going as well in a few weeks, but not to talk about access oh. with a different hat on. So I'd be quite happy if if there was space. Those interested make themselves known to me. Yeah. Janet. So it's email me. Okay, that's fine. So moving on to item eleven. Dorset Rowan. <laughs> So just while I'm getting this on the screen, um, so this is just basically to update the local access forum um, on the progress so far and also to allow you to know some of the emerging headlines that's coming out from the presentation today. Just to set the scene, um, as you all know, uh, and you the last also helped and fed into this. We've done a major um, online public 
survey <coughs> is extensively distributed um, to the general public, land managers, all the user groups, um, various sort of sub-user groups. So there's multiple sort of equestrian, walking and cycling groups, as well as the key sort of players. Wider access related organisations, so everyone, you know, from the educational side and tourism and health and transport, and equality, disability, and diversity groups. Um, it's highly publicised also on Dorset Council social media, um, local press and publications. I did some radio interviews, and then we asked that database to use their networks and further promote. So it's you know, beyond what we know, that it's also gone further afield. We've also done numerous presentations internally, externally, um, sometimes on requests and sometimes where we need to seek more information, um, but also internally with our partners so we can start identifying where we have shared strategic aims, where those organisations might be able to flag up access issues we're not aware of, uh, what their aspirations are, where we might be able to put in some resources. There was also numerous individual submissions. We've also gone out to all the parish town councils, as I mentioned earlier. We'll use the opportunity to refresh the database on our right-to-way liaison officers and then also consult and send the survey out to them. Um, land managers um, have been consulted with their own survey, but they could also feed into the online one as well. So that's people representing it. Um, I've also been asked to go out by various user groups for attending various one-to-one -one meetings. That's also been followed up with emails and phone calls. I've worked with all the neighbouring highway authorities or uh, county boundary issues, and so we're pulling that data in. And of course, um, yourselves at the forum. The online survey <coughs> we were told was hugely successful in response. Um, we tend to get, I, mean, I, I sit on the parish council, and sometimes a clerk will go through various sort of issues, but we are inundated with consultations and surveys and information. And now um, the electronic system means that you can just press these things out, you know, on the, on the hour, if not on the minute. So there's a lot of fatigue out there. So we got approximately a thousand responses. We were told that was really, really strong. Um, there are, there were problems. There were technical issues with the electronic survey. Uh, we only have so much resource within the council. The IT team worked really hard on this, were brilliant in the time they devoted to it. But sometimes, so for example, on your phone, if people are trying to use a survey on their phone, the map wouldn't lay in, so there were some technical problems. And also um, with the analysis, whereas we we're hoping for some sort of computerized analysis, that sort of fallen back more to us, which sort of slowed things up a little bit. However, it is, it is ongoing. And like I said, we've got approximately a thousand responses. And then those of you who are familiar, I know you all are with the form, you could then provide numerous comments. So as much as it being quantitative, it was also qualitative. And you were invited on various questions to give three enhancement ideas. So along with those 1,000 responses, we've got over 1,500 comments and over 1,000 enhancement project proposals. And sifting through those initially, it's to establish actually some of these are maintenance issues, so they aren't enhancements. So it's then directing them off to um, the Ranger team and making sure they're inputted or see if there's any duplication on the system. And then it's also then refining all those enhancement ideas and trying to categorise those. And sometimes in people's comments, there were multiples, but they aren't so clearly cut. So it, it takes a lot of time to process and work through all those comments to categorise. And some of those, it's lifting some of them out to help reinforce um, and test against what are the emerging key issues from the general over, you know, overview of the response and the percentage feedback. And some of those will be actioned in the action plan to be used to inform projects as we develop them. We also asked about the trunk road. This was raised earlier by Paul. Um, and uh, Nicola, I think, um, as you know, it's been an ongoing project, project working with national um, highways. And when we explained about our timetable, they said it's it perfect timing. So we asked about trunk roads and asked people to prioritise and give potential crossing points. So we've got 173 um, of those. They are now currently being mapped, so I can analyse those. I'm really hopeful that there are loads of duplicates, because if there's loads of duplicates, it's going to give us priority to work with. Similarly, with the UCRs. Um, as we've established, we, um, Coast and Countryside, don't manage UCLs, the highways team do, but obviously, as we all know, they're invaluable as links and helping that network and filling gaps, but also that strategic network, and they're great because it's multi-use. 
Um, again, 146 were prioritised as potential right-to-way network links, and again, we're mapping those so we can analyse them again. Let's hope there's loads of duplicates because then we'll have some key players that will fly off the map. And like I said, there's all that additional listed previously that we're having to pull into that and analyse and compare. So currently, we're analysing all that consultation data, quantitative and qualitative. Um, you have to compare and contrast. Um, so you'll see as I come to some of the emerging headliners, some of the things the landowners respond is quite interesting because it sometimes contradicts all questions to what the public are feeding back. So it's probing deeper, comparing that information, further analysis, and filling gaps so where there might be some gaps in the data, seeing if we can get that information now in time for the draft plan, or whether we're going to have to action that and say, we identify there's a gap here and we're going to have to make this into a project that will be part of the delivery of the next moment. And we're also now doing the from mapping, but not so much on the ground, but from mapping, you know, where are the where are the huge gaps in the network, um, where are the road severance issues. Um, Dorset is a big county and there's lots of rights away and lots of roads. So it's it's more of those strategic higher ones, and inevitably a lot of the focus project work will have to be put into the delivery plan. So where we identify, for example, a huge road severance issue. There will not be the time or capacity to do that in time to produce the rope. And, and the rope is a snapshot of that time. But there will be then, say, a road severance um, action you know, in the delivery plan that then we will focus in, for example, and find out what the key points are. And then in, by pulling all that together, it's then making those links with the other strategies and policies. So that where there's key links, key um, overlaps, key shared delivery, and also key resources. And also applying all that a little bit, what you discussed today about looking at how we currently manage and maintain our rights of way, where we might need to review policy or practice, and then also being quite honest, you know, what we can or can't, or we are can or you know, are capable of doing, and what the resources are, and what our priorities are. Be you know, very honest and, and open, and straight in the future, taking rights of way improvements some forward in the future. So we have adjusted the timetable to do it because we want to do a third job as we can. Um, Comparing the Dorset Rowett for the next 10 years um, within the resources available. So, in giving you an overview of the findings so far, um, it's always nice to know if it's robust and we if that's all been assessed and is high statistical significance. So, it does give us a comprehensive insight into the views of rights way users and land managers. However, the typical respondents was white 45 plus with no disability or long term illness. Um, it doesn't capture the view of non-users. Um, the views of Black, Asian or other ethnic minority groups are underrepresented, and the views of people with disability or health issues are underrepresented. All those groups were on the database. They were all um, sent to survey and various follow-ups. I am conscious that some of those groups might find that methodology difficult to respond to, and it's something that Dorset Council are acutely aware of and are working on. They too have got a new team set up and, um, and I'm working with them closely on that. And we're looking at other ways that we can reach those groups. And if we can pull some information together from those groups in time for producing the draft, all well being good. But if not, you know, I will highlight where all the gaps are in the work because that's equally as important. And if we'll action that, you know, the more work needs to be done with these groups. But generally, it was robust. It had um, the adequate number of responses. And interestingly enough, the research team has said that if you compare 6,000 responses to 1,000 responses, you generally, in percentages, seem to be getting the same sort of feedback. So that's a good marker. So we're, we're pretty confident on that. Um, so we asked people about, first and foremost, just generally about their landscapes and what they enjoyed. And basically, people valued all sorts of landscapes, but particularly, they enjoyed woodland, the coast farmland and followed by historic landscape. So what I've, we had a whole list, if you remember, of landscape types. What I've done is sort of prioritise the first three, four, and sometimes I go as far as five because it, they're so close in response. So this is, if you can go anywhere and everywhere, this isn't the ones you tend to go to, but this is your sort of choice. Um, so woodland coming out of the top, like I say, coast. I thought coast might come before woodland, but actually it comes second, and farmland, like I say, historic landscapes. Uh, Heathland, rivers and lakes, nature reserves, public open spaces, Downland and open access land, they all were there, they followed. And it was really interesting because open access land did come up at the list, whereas a lot of people, I think, feel it's not. The main landscapes people visited are farmland. So this is when we said, OK, that's your wish list. But, you know, every day, what are the main ones you go to? So farmland. And again, I think that's quite typical because most people from their doorstep is going to be farmland. 
followed by Woodland or Forest, then the coast, and then open access land. And again, open access land coming up there because I think a lot of people are concerned or feel that no one understands what open access land is. We did give a definition, so but people are rating it higher than expected. Country parks, parks, playgrounds, and sangs, they're sustainable alternative natural green space. So you tend to get that for development to mitigate against, say, pressure on Eastland or below. Like I say, this might reflect the proximity of respondents to those places, but we did include them on there. Uh, we asked people why they value a rights of way and, you know, is this for walking or health reasons? And again, this is really interesting because what's called walking, and it's lovely to see, is it's about how it enhances people's quality of life. So providing opportunities um, in a natural environment, and that people, they wanted to feel like they were very much in a natural environment get off that urban feel so they can keep healthy relax and unwind and it was really important that rights away were there for them to enable them to meet up with friends and family and it enhanced their overall or mental health and well-being so that scored really high that was higher than any of the user activities however when you then get next going into what those user activities it, it comes across obviously strongly that those act, outdoor activities are really important to people and unsurprisingly walking is by, by far the most popular activity followed by dog walking running horse riding and the dog walking to horse riding they were all very very close but walking by far the highest and that's very typical nationally and I don't think anyone then I broke it down into um, trying to understand how people use rights of way to access the local facilities so the practical journeys perhaps then it was local countryside and that was within two to three miles of your of your home and then it was the wider countryside and we wanted to do this because obviously local facilities are practical and the countryside is arguably more for leisure. You know, when you get home from work every day of the week, I'm going to nip out and get some fresh air. You're only going to be able to do that really from the doorstep. And then, then perhaps it's more when you've got more leisure time, holiday or weekends, whether you're going out to the wider countryside. So focusing on local facilities, this is really great because on a weekly or daily basis, there was a significant number of respondents that use rights of way to get to local facilities. So that's great. People use them day to day or at least briefly. They're using rights way to do this. This is how important how useful they are. This is great for stable transport, climate and ecology, and also building in everyday health and well-being. But there are barriers that prevent more people from doing so. And the big one, and you'll see this coming up in a minute, is vegetation overgrowth. That's big, um, um, when it came to wider and local countryside, I've grouped these two. A significant number of respondents highly value the Dorset public rights of ways and regularly for leisure and recreation. Again, thankfully, no surprise there. Um, as I said, local countryside was two to three miles. That's daily um, from your home. So that, that was on a daily, weekly basis. Yeah, people said, yeah, you know, thank goodness I can get home. I can get out there and do stress and my doorstep. And wider countryside, actually, it was weekly and then throughout the month. So again, you know, weekly, people are actually going further afield, which is brilliant. However, but they too are experiencing numerous barriers. So maintenance and rights of way. So most people using uh, rights of way have encountered problems that have made it difficult for them to use or prevented them from using public parks. And the biggie was overgrown vegetation. That one came out very hard. Um, the next one, not too far back, was core signage. And, and it, this all relates to the whole thing about easy to find, follow and use. Um, signage. And it did vary. We'll come into signage in a little bit more detail about way markings, I asked a question about single post signings in the road, but also way marking. The next one was core condition and design of infrastructure, noted to be styles. And then it was the surface generally people felt fine with and they felt that they had to dress appropriately, but it was deep mud and all floods. And of course, with our climate changing, we are having long hot summers drying out the ground, as we've discussed before, and then we're getting these sort of um, real sort of major episodes of, of water and, and increasing the flooding um, and deep mud being an issue. And this, again, is something that within the row, there is a section that's looking about climate change. It did it in row at one and it talked about future proofing and how we might have to look at how we manage and maintain things and also how we might want to adapt the network because some of these locations are going to be a constant drain on our resources. And so perhaps we need to tweak and manage and develop our network. Parts are structured by crops or not reinstated after planning. So they were the top one. Mm -hmm. Um, so signage, so we focus a bit more on signage, so finger posts, two out of three have found that it is not easy to find past from where they leave a metal road. Um, and I put in some quotes here, and, and throughout the group there's lots of comments and quotes, it really sort of brings it to life and adds that sort of real sort of colour to it. 
So for example, the quote here is the problem is difficult to seeing the markers due to vegetation or placing the markers. And when it came to mark way markers, four out of five have found that it is not easy to follow the road. The route. Four out of five. Yeah. Now you've got to remember that when I'm going through all this, different people have different responsibilities for the main thing like way. So Dorset Council, we're responsible for doing certain things, and the landowners are responsible for certain things. Signing finger posts is a responsibility to ourselves for metal rows. Way markers is more of a desirable, um, not you know, sort of statutory sort of duty. So but there, but obviously, you know, it, what's so exciting and lovely when you do this research is there's naturally themes and issues that are coming out that will be lovely projects that we can build on, working with landowners, working with the public, working with communities to actually resolve these problems so that, you know, people getting out there can enjoy these routes with confidence and we can get more people out there enjoying it. Right, so we make notes, maintenance, seaside and reporting problems. So again, we looked at seaside, we asked if people understood seaside if they were aware that it was there how easy it was to use and everything um again it's all about improving what we do it's improving what we do so it's better for people working within the service you know it's sort of less stressful and, and more easy for them to work and also people enjoying it so this was a sort of 60 40 um about people being aware of whether seaside um exists so possibly there's more awareness raising needed although giles might think we're doing one more reports <laughs> on the system but more awareness raising needed of how to report right to a problem on the Dorset Council website, just so that people know how they can do that. And actually, and that's quite interesting because we often are asked, I've got a problem and they're not aware of seaside. So that's just a sort of information raising. That, that, that can mm -hmm. be easily done. I would just add that seaside is what officers use to call it. Yeah. It does it's not public facing. So that, that they they probably won't know what seaside is. Sorry, in the in the consultation it was it was very much about how you report a problem. So it was the, the public facing. The public facing yeah. thing. Yeah. Um the great news is that those that do use it, six percent said they felt it was easy to do so. And and I'm not going to obviously that shows show there's forty percent that, that don't, but some of them sort of sort of were neither here nor there. However, Two and three people raised concerned about right away problems not being dealt with promptly or weren't aware of the outcome. And this relates a little bit, I think, back to the feedback. And I know in previous years when we talked about feeding back, it's always been considered quite difficult to feed back to everybody who reports the problem. And that's why we have the MNT number so people can go in and try and see the progress. So this is something that's been raised before, and that was the current issue with about right away problems and reporting problems. The legal record, the definitive map statement. Again, we asked, do you know what it is? Do you know what role it is? How you can work with it? How you can use it? You know, and all the rest of it. Again, sort of 6040 understanding about the legal um, record. Um, very low people understood it, um, were quite confused by it. So again, this is a sort of information and making that more accessible. Um, and you know, simply sort of annually, you know, on all these, it could just be sort of putting an education sort of campaign out there that's informing. Uh, to the parish council etc and only 13 percent think it's widely publicized and easy to access or use so there is some work on that if we want to get more people to engage with the legal record and how to use it and i think in doing that will also help actually um ness and her team because there's less need for that team then to support people when they want to try and use that legal, um, legal record public transport um Sort of knew what the response was going to be, but asked the question: Do you use rights of way and public transport together? So, do you use public transport to go out there and use your rights of way? No big surprise. The public transport team, um, you know, have a huge task trying to improve public transport, get um, public transport providers to work together, and actually provide services. And a lot of them are being cut back for a big rural area. So, the majority of respondents, 87%, do not use public transport to reach and use rights of way because, of course, private transport is more practical. Um, because public transport is neither unavailable or infrequent. As I said, I'm talking internally to various people, and one of the teams I'm talking with and we've been putting this um, data back to is the transport team. Um, I've also attended various other transport meetings, so all this is sort of feeding into what they're doing and and then feed back into the final sort of work to explain a certain current context and how we might move forward with that. Information. So we asked about how people find out about rights of way, the sort of routes they use, promoted routes, very sort of question. Um, I think a lot of people were surprised by this because I hate technology, I wasn't. <laughs> but most people use their own local knowledge and rely on 
paper OS maps rather than digital. They much rather have paper maps to um, uh, to find their way around. And that was the top one, local so knowledge, OS maps and word of mouth. Lower down the line was Dorset Council website, leaflets and digital maps, so they came much lower. When asked if people felt they knew about their responsibility, there was enough educational information, you know, how to go out there and safely use and enjoy rights away, what was expected of people? Again, it's a 50-50 split, so there's some work that we could do there in helping to educate and inform um, and guide in a very positive and constructive way. People really do value and use and enjoy the various promoted routes across Dorset. And we gave a selection of one of some of the key, I think about 10, 15, but respondents added more routes. So in the end, we ended up with 23 sort of promoted routes. And alongside that, they provided 77 additional improvement ideas to work with them. And again, I think this is no surprise that the Dorset Coast Path was the most used and enjoyed from it. Landowners' top concerns, um, dog control. I mean, a lot of you are probably conscious of the big uh, campaign relating with Egan Hill Gladys campaign about dogs being off the lead and the death of livestock there. So safety of their livestock, dog control, real big one. Gates being left open, dog fouling and illegal and irresponsible use of rights of way. And interesting, one of the big ones that came out with that was landowners' concerns about cyclists using footpaths. And one of the consequences of that is disturbing and unsettling livestock, but also damaging infrastructure when they're trying to lift their bikes over stiles and breaking stiles. Um, a lot of the respondents with the landowners said that they actually use their rights away to enhance their business. Predominantly, it was for visitor access related to campsites, but also some educational roles there too, right? 56% of landowners uh, felt they practically managed rights away on their land. And those so that don't, because I was asking if you don't, why not? She said that just out of the time, well, they actually think the Dorset Council should be doing all of that aspect. Interesting at the bottom, which doesn't necessarily correlate with the public's response or signage, the majority of the landowners feel that the paths on their land are easy to find and follow. However, we've got to remember that the landowners responding may be really brilliant at keeping them all in top lit and the ones that the public are responding to are perhaps other rights of way. But it's just an interesting thing to remember. I've just um, I've just been going through all the data on our younger um, responses. We haven't we didn't have a huge number, but from the short to 35 age group, we had a good um, quantity. So I've been going through that in detail, and I I didn't have time to put the issue. But I've also been involved with the OMB on a young they have been doing to access the urban barriers. I was involved in a meeting the other evening, and it was really interesting because. Some of what they say confirms and reinforces what's coming up from the road, but a lot from the road was also helping to sort of go back and inform. There's a lot of young people there that we're talking to about some of the stuff that perhaps they don't understand. And I think it was quite highlighted again about that whole need about um, education, perhaps, and responsibilities, but making sure we're also targeting the group. I know in road one, we identified lots of gaps, and one of them was information for families, information for young people, we tend not to do anything that really encourages or informs that group in the way that accessible information they need. So those would be gaps that we flag up in the row two. Row at one, they were the sort of themes that we had at the beginning um, from uh, row at one. The sort of themes that were going around at the moment, but these are not set in stone. And as we're finding more made tweet these um, are about mapping and understanding the rights way at it. Uh, Carl and Giles have said before about understanding the condition. We, we have nothing really to go on about that condition other than we know the number of um, quantities of infrastructure so we can sort of give four part figures on the quantities and the maintenance costs but when it's actually understanding the condition we sort of have to read between the lines about the feedback we're getting back on maintenance reports and that's the situation what the key issues are taking care of the rights away asset developing a network as i've said we've got rights away but i would never call it a network because it's so broken in many mm -hmm. respects um knowing where to go that's all about information access for all that's that wider group and then the effect of delivery which sort of is all this feeding back and informing maintenance and management but like i say those themes are very loose at the moment they're not there. so and i've also got to take a block of leave over the summer so it, don't expect that to be planning on it so i am doing it but i wouldn't take it so that's where we're at the moment and um and we will be revising the timetable accordingly with the aim of getting that draft out by the end of the year but there is a lot of work to do there and there are a lot of other people going on leave that we need to do. But it's, it's, it's really interesting and exciting, the findings that are coming out, because there are a lot of similarities there with row one, 
but there's like I say a lot of interesting com companions from casting so I'm whittling it down now so I've been doing the equestrians and the walkers and the cyclists and all different things there that then feeds back in and compares to this more broader general overview for the public as well but like I said I touched on the landowners because I've sort of finished that area so the, there, there is a, de a more detailed analytical report major art so this is just giving you a feel for the issues that come around. Thank you very much. Very, very informative report. Fiona, you wanted to come in. Fiona, you're on mute. Yeah, I hadn't got my hand up though. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> I'll be late oh, me. Right. Um, Mandy, you wanted to come in. Briefly, um, just a couple of points as we're going through there. I think one of them we touched on at some point in the past, which was about um, you know, people being able to find their way on, on rights of way. And we were talking about signage. I'm sure we talked about this before, that if you go around, say, sort of Fiddleford, around sort of Fiddleford in the, um, the North Dorset Trailway, a lot of the rights of way signs tell you where you're going. They're not just pointing that this is the right of way. They say, two and a half miles to Fiddleford Manor or, you know, whatever. Um, whereas in most places, um, you know, certainly around where I am, it would just say there's a right of way down there and people go, well, where does that go? Well, it goes to Ham Preston Church, you know, but you, they wouldn't know that. Um, yeah. So I think that the signage is an interesting thing. And I think um, Tara was saying about sangs and interestingly enough we've got a relatively new sang um in longham which is where homewood park development was built and we had a residence meeting a couple of weeks ago and we were talking about where you know what areas people were using and someone mentioned the sign and people went well what what is that i don't even know what it is and i think what what we were saying was when these new green spaces are um made um why don't they call them something so people can relate to them because sang is a planning term you know it's not it's not something you know it's not a particularly nice term um you know it's it's a lot of people won't even know what it stands for so um it was just interesting that if you look at sort of parks that have been around for donkey's years they'll always be called something won't they you know whereas these days we just seem to refer to something as a sang yeah, and I just doesn't. Well, should we? We'll meet at the Sang, or well, which one? Camford, Long. You know, it's quite an interesting one. Even it, it Camford Magna. I don't know if you know they've built a big one um, next to the, the River Stour there, and they put a big sign over it saying Camford Sang. Yeah. It's just a, more of an observation, I think. It just seems to confuse people as to what it actually is. And that's picked up, Mandy, in some of the. Uh, comments that have come back in relation in more detail to the questions and I and I'd agree because when I go out and sang sites I think that like you say those terms and making it more sort of local in the ownership and that's very much come mm. through. I, there is a standard on signage isn't there? Yeah mm. and um, I presume that as the signs become dilapidated the standard which Mandy points out is at Fiddleford which should have what it is public whether it's a footpath or a right way etc etc um a destination and a distance because otherwise it doesn't make sense really and and i think you know i noted about your your thing about map people wanting to read maps but lots of people can't read a map i mean yeah. I, I was surprised at that because the majority of people in the country would find it very difficult to actually read a map and therefore they depend on actually having good signage yeah. so they, they they know where they're going i mean and that relates to the national that's what i was saying there's this other research bringing into that which is yeah. it's interesting to compare and contrast to the findings were coming out but based on that thousand approximately and something like going back when, it, when they had to prioritize those were the key things but word of mouth being way up there high but exactly what you're saying nationally there's the findings is key is to find following news because people are on that more than anything and having that confidence Mandy. I'm going to um, come back on what Janet was saying. That, you know, if you, if you think about the signs, what, what was coming out in there about under, overgrowth, which we all know, the, the more a path you, you know, path to use, the, the, the less 
you know, they tend to become overgrown. And, and a great example, again, I do use one local to me, which is Longham Lakes, which is massively popular. But you've got styles that then go out onto the really lovely footpath, which all lead up through, you know, um, Hampreston Woods and up to up to the Sour Valley, um, up along to the Sour Valley Way and beyond. But people just walk past them because there's, there's nothing to say where they're going. So there are all oh, some woods down there. I'll, you know, I'll head off down there. So they, they, those paths are so little used, and I'm convinced it's because people don't know where they're going. Oh, on the specific issue of signing, I have a recollection that in the original record, there was a policy statement we would renew all our signs every X years. And it would be interesting to find out what came of them. But um, more importantly, you had a throwaway line on one of your slides about the timetable is being really fine. Mm. Well, are you able to put any pressure on the bones of that? No, we'll, we are re we'll redefine it and put that out, but it's not no dates or months or anything set other than say that, you know, by the end of the year we have a draft that's what we're aiming for. Like I said, no, you know, and also leave. And also, the amount of feedback we've had, there's a lot of information there. We want to make this as robust as possible. There's, can easily sort of just tick a list and do something at this level, but actually want to make this work this is setting up for the next 10 years. There's a lot lot of information to get to there. Like I said, you think I'm wading through 1,500 comments in one and thousands in another and 10 on that. It's got a lot of stuff away. And it's not just a relic. The, the thing I took away from it, four out of five could not write a word. Yeah. That, that's concerning. It's, and it's not surprising though, though, is it? You know, I mean, if we haven't got good signage and people can't read maps, uh, I mean, it's, I mean, I go back to uh, when I when I met somebody in a pub in Wimborne and we got talking because she came from London. And, uh, you know, I said, are you enjoying it? And she said, well, what I miss is having anywhere to go for a walk. Because when I was in London, living in East London, I could go, I went out every morning and I could do myself a 35, 40, 40 minute walk. And now there's nowhere to go. Well, that's because she's faced with where does she go when you're living in the middle of Wimborne? Where does she go for that 45 minute walk? If you can't read a map and you don't know where there is, and there's no, you know, there's no direction. So that's, I thought, I mean, that my mouth fell open, but it's an eye opener to how people look it's at very these sad. things. Very yes, sad. this is incredibly sad. Uh, Joe, just on that point, and Tara, I'm interested in your view on this. Is it reasonable to expect that you could follow a right of way for 45 minutes with nothing else but way marking? You say reasonable, I suppose it's it's the resource capacity and who does that way marking. I think I think the rights of way, I would say from a user's point of view, it would be reasonable, like it would be if you're on a road using a car, it's reasonable, isn't it? You know, it is reasonable. Also, yeah. on top of reasonable, I think it's highly beneficial for both landowner, manager, and user. Yeah. And hoping to minimise any problems and also allow that. Oh yeah, of course it's it's a good thing. I'm just saying, is it is it is that ever going to happen? I mean, I take your point about the road network. But most people have a sat nav, or most people have a map of the road network. Is it going? Do you think it will be an aspiration that? You will be able to walk from Wimborne to Blanford with nothing I, else but Waymark. I think I think it's a like I say our duty is not signpost but not Waymark. So, but if we're there, the road is about enhancing and increasing opportunity. If that's being identified as a barrier to use, yeah. then we need to address it. But I think it's where that government fate, you know, famous phrase with develops is innovative and creative solution. And I think it's going to be some campaign or project. 
bring together landowners and user groups and communities to then maintain and put that way mm. marking in because we haven't got the resources to send our voters in. Well, I, I also heard it mentioned about around North Dorset where the signing is much better and signs you to actually the destination. And that was done, that was an innovative project with the Sturmiston Newton Town Council where we shared the costs of improving that signage so that you do know the destination. Well, I, and I, I actually think that it, it should be prioritised to being around where people live as well, because you might expect in the middle of nowhere, for instance, that it's going to be somebody who is a more serious walker who is more than happy to get out their well, wad of OS maps and decide where they're going and and actually enjoy the challenge of finding where they're going. But when you've got conurbations, whether they're little market towns or what have you, or you know, big villages or even small villages, you might expect that you get better signage yeah. around those areas that so people can do what is considered to be healthy Is is it two and a half kilometres or something? I can't remember. I never, I never remember. Anyway, it's something like that, isn't it? Um, two and a half kilometres or something like that. So they can do that circular walk. Mm. Given close to where yeah. people live, but if you're on the top of the downs, that is a different different thing altogether. Yeah. But even so, I mean, I don't see that it's that difficult as signs to as signs wear out. To, to decide to put a signage in yeah. which has got public right away distance. In row at one, that was very much stated that you know where possible, and it was very much about that connecting and allowing people to easily walk within and link to neighbouring communities. And now to wider countryside, it's very much said that where possible, again resources are, are hard, and it's about putting all that information on there. But at the time, that was very much so probably is. Um, so they're getting that in a bit of ways, but it was working with communities and ways, but informative signage, yeah, within. So people have that confidence. And like I say, as they build that confidence, then they develop the confidence to go further afield. And at the time, we also did look at Dorset. And um, I know I mooted at the time, we looked at Dorset at different areas. So you had sort of like the urban fringe, but you also had the wilder west. So you might get different experiences. So people out in West Dorset might be more inclined to need a map and they want that experience. Yeah. But at the time, but that's something again um that i've yet to raise it does but when we look at how we manage and maintain perhaps we want to look at the character of the landscape but that's like i said that's slightly that next stage on the whole so harris has um have um uh, produced some um, um leaflets of the house in their area what's going to hold up and go to mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, um, I think Paul May may have done and um, uh, uh, we we're about to do it in um, Maiden Newton. And some do it separately or in conjunction with the council and it's all these sort of yeah. projects we're trying to pull in and, and how we can do it. Yeah, the, the last thing I'll say on this is that, is that uh, all of what you suggest has been done. We work with the Newton Town Council on some walkabout leaflets, which are those circular walks around Stone Tune, I think, uh, and they're available online. I recommend anyone Google Stone to Newton walkabout leaflets. Um, the priority signing, where it tells you where you're going. I think all of those great things, and it's about expanding the small areas that they've done. But the reason they happen in Stemmons and Newton is because we had a town council who was really on board. And really keen. And we'll throw that. Very proud. And helped fund it. Even though the, the, the numbers involved were very small financially. So do you get pounds. in touch with things like town councils and say, this is what you could do? Yeah. We would like to work with you but this is what you need to contribute as well. We have done, but because... we, we, it's often when we've had a positive dialogue with the town council. So it uh, kind of happened organically because 
service to the Euton Town Council were asking how they how we could improve our local area. And then that started that relationship which paid dividends with all those improvements. And if yeah. you're very well, working with them. Well, you'd, you'd hope that Wimborne and Wareham and other other towns, as well as yeah, as well as Dorchester, you you just hope that they'd all want to do that. Yeah, I think what we're talking about is is expanding the best practice which yes. we have done. Well, may, make maybe in the row of row it, you all show Sturmins to Newton as the best practice. We can, I mean, and also there's other town councils who've just done it off their own back as well. I mean, Brookport's a classic one right. with that one. So, and I think. I was saying it's coming down to actually and saying well, if this is a way of resolving some of those issues and working with the partners then this would be an activity that we're working for you know some campaign in doing that i'm going to have to go get yeah. my car park yeah i'm ever so sorry yeah part of the situation revolves i believe around information boards and i'm going to talk about the fact that clearly there's a lot of tourism in what i would call Southern part of Dorset compared to North Dorset. Yeah. But even within an individual ward, such as the Marshall Bell Ward, last night up at the Marshall Bell Parish Council, there was a comment about information boards, for instance, opposite the entrance to Pilston Pen, the car park there, and the fact that there should be better um, information boards. But it isn't just that. It isn't just that. Because even with the um, flagship um, property of the National Trust, i.e. with the Golden Cap Estate. To take you to the Golden Cap Estate in your minds now, if you are catching the bus to the Golden Cap Estate, getting off at the ship in, and then you're walking up ship lane and you're entering the Golden Cap Estate, there isn't an information board to help you. Now the point is, even if you get into the Golden Cap Estate and you start accessing the footpaths, because there aren't that many information boards, and if you cannot read a map, you're not necessarily St. Wit as well, and then you get to uh, Pickaxe Cross. You're not naturally going to do the detour and go down to the pond so beloved of Julia Bradbury, because you're not going to be aware that you've got to do the detour to get onto the footpath, to go down to the pond, and then get to the foot of Golden Cap. You're naturally going to go down the um, gravel road towards the holiday cottages, etc., Stanton St Gabriel and the old church. Why are you going to do that? Because there isn't sufficient information, even with the National Trust. Now, of course, when you come back and retrace your steps, you've got a lovely crossing because I fought for that when Oliver Leppard was almost run over crossing the A35. So we've got a new crossing. Terrific. Mm -hmm. But people will only access places if they have information. And it's a very worrying thing at the moment because older people don't even have the benefit of um, paper train timetables. They seem to have disappeared as well. So in terms of actually accessing by public transport and then going for a walk, it's actually getting harder. Sorry, I'll we'll run there, but oh, okay. I can be done. Well, thank you very much for the report. Thank you, Tara. I really note that. So, item 12, consultation. So, the Forest Commission one, um, it was on um, the time of the agenda was to be confirmed, but as you all know, that was an error on their part, so we don't have to worry about that one. And it was just to ratify the review of statutory directions for Portland done by Janet Davis, which is the Glover. By Janet Davis, several confirming that they, you know, that we everyone firmed up and responded. It's just we're ratifying it at the meeting. Oh, yes. Um, so we'll take that as on the nod. Uh, item 14 member feedback from associated groups and meetings. Yeah. Well, we'll postpone that one to we'll postpone that, but yeah. I think Janet's going to send an email around. Yeah. The work program. Something. Yeah, it was whether basically it's so we keep revising the work program so we can add to it from today, but there's other people that we have it. Right. And any other business? I have no other business. I'm looking up 
to see if any hands raised. I see Fiona putting a hand up. Yeah. Yes. Um, as I mentioned last night, I did attend the local nature partnership. They are open to having some better join up on access because you can't deliver people caring for nature if you can't get into nature. And I have drafted a paper. Are you happy that I send that perhaps to Tara or Gemma to circulate? Because their next meeting is September and they're happy to receive that paper then. That's fine. Yes. No objections. That's fine. Thank you, Fiona. <laughs> Very kind of you. Um, and then finally, date the next meeting. Can I, can I yes. So it's just a plea for myself and Gemma. When we send out um, information and ask for a response, can everyone make it clear whether they agree, disagree, or abstain? Or, and especially for meetings, it's just it's ever so hard when we're trying to organise things. And I think also a similar plea was echoed by some of the working groups when they send information. If you get it to look at, please make it clear. Everyone responds, you know, agree, don't agree, or abstain. We also need that for our records monitoring with the lab as well when we feed back to Natural England. So just to keep everything at that board. Thank you. Right. And Thank you. The and the date of the next meeting will be Thursday, the 24th of November at 10 a.m. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.